My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Counter them, they will not mean so much to you anymore. Imagine for a second that you came into this world at the age of 25 and then you just stood in the world and you looked to the heavens and you saw the clouds. You saw the blue sky and you saw the cloud moving. If you are not careful, you will faint and die. But you see, because you grew up as a child and you began to interact with some of these very strange realities, it became normal to you. So even as an adult, you don't settle down to contemplate the power that holds the foundations of the earth. You don't sit down to contemplate the power that causes the cloud to hover in the heavens, hanging on nothing. Everything that is supposed to be supernatural to you becomes normal because you came up as a child and you were not taught the mysteries that make these things to work. Job was like that, walking with the Lord. It didn't occur to him that the clouds in the heavens, the waters in the, in the river, that kept their boundaries, it didn't occur to him that it was an invisible hand that made things work the way they worked. He never knew that the superlative intelligence that divine designed the patterns in creation was put in place by an invisible force until the plague of his life came to him. And in the midst of crisis and adversity, Job lifted up his voice and began to lament against God. And for the first time, God appeared to him and made him understand that even the creation around him was supposed to inform him of the supernatural dimensions of God. It became normal for Job that the waters were there because the waters wanted to flow in their courses. He thought the cloud was there because it was so. He thought the, the thunder, the lightning, everything was the way they were because they were occurrences in nature. And when God showed up in Job chapter 38 verse 1, he said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that speaks out of tone because it's obviously bereft of requisite intelligence in interacting with the divine? And in verse 31 of that scripture, God began to ask him questions that inform the borderlines of creation. It's natural that you woke up this morning and you thought you were awake because of biological process. Until the, the Lord appears to you and begins to ask you, by what intelligence are the bones formed in her that is with child? Until God begins to ask you again, by what intelligence does the breath on your nostril, how is it sustained on your nostril? Then for the first time it will turn on you that everything happening around you is supernatural. And that you have been summoned to walk with an invincible spirit that sustains the supernatural stature. An awareness will come to you. And then you will have to, if you are reasonable, contemplate why you were put here. So we wanted to look at the matters of our lives that bordered on purpose. We wanted to look at what life itself was about. But unfortunately, time could not afford us that privilege last night. So tonight, I want to show you some of the heavy molecules that God considers when He deals with humankind. And some of us will realize that these things are not part of our lives. So, but paraventure, we leave this world today and we get to eternity. We will just realize that we didn't appear in the radar of heaven. It's possible that a man will cross from time to eternity and then it will down on him that even though he breathed oxygen for 90 years, he never appeared in the radar of heaven. 
that man would have been a waste of divine supply. Because what you don't realize is that the air on your nostrils, the life that you live, is an investment of divinity. And by the time life and time is accomplished, God will ask questions as touching the things that he has given to you. And every man that fails to maximize those divine investments in his soul will discover that he is a waste as far as the equation of divinity is concerned. And when God comes to judge among men, such people will not have a place with God. This is why we cry every day that by all means our lives will count. Because it's possible to walk through time and your life never counts. That's the greatest affliction of humankind. That a man will walk through time and his life will not count. When you cross to eternity, there is no privilege of redemption. There is no privilege of making amends. There is no privilege of correction. Life is so deadly. <laughs> it's like a scientific research. You see, when you carry out a research, you spend the time, the money and everything. It's at the end of the research you will find out whether you were correct or not. You would have wasted all the resources. The drugs they produce sometimes take 20 years to get into the market. When you have spent all the billions and then you get into the market, you now discover that that drug was a poison. Then you have to destroy everything and begin again. A man can cross to eternity and when everything, mercy, grace has been dispensed on his life, then he realizes that with the provision of grace and mercy, God will say he didn't leave because he didn't appear on the radar of heaven. Kenneth Hagin was a pastor for 13 years. When Jesus appeared to him, Jesus told him, you have taken your first step into your prophetic call. So for 13 years as a pastor, serving the Lord with all his heart, he had not begun to scratch what was written concerning him. What a waste that life would have been if he did not join into the spirit to find out what was written concerning his destiny. Moses lived in Egypt for 40 years. The angels that were writing his story on earth had nothing to write. So the life of a man for 40 years was only in 8 verses. 8 verses of the Bible. 40 years of his life there was nothing to write. And even in those 8 verses of the Bible nothing was written about him. It was the things that happened when he had no consciousness or no participatory ability that were written. For himself the angels that were writing his story had nothing to write for 40 years. The day the scribe began to write his story was the day the Bible said and Moses came of age. The day Moses' life began to count was the day Moses began to walk according to the dictates of ordination. Could it be that you have lived for the past 19 years? Could it be that you have lived for the past 23 years? And if we were to check your dose here in heaven, there is no score. Is it possible that all this while, with the mercy of God and the grace of God that has been lavished on your life, nothing has been added to heaven on your account? What if the Lord appears tonight and calls upon your name and wants to speak concerning you? Could it be that you have not even discovered the reason you are here? This is why we cry. I told you there is nothing wrong in making progress in life. There is nothing wrong, wrong in prospering in life. We are all making the most of life. But I say everything we achieve in life, we count if that thing is squandered on the reason for which we came here. God is too intelligent to bring you here for no reason. The first reason we cry for revival is so that we will become like unto the Father. In nature and in essence, being like Him and doing exactly what He wants us to be and do. If you don't know what to cry about, 
You may cry all your life, but you will amount to nothing. If you don't know what to live for, you may spend all your life reading and spending all you have, but it will be a wasted investment. Where does life begin to have meaning from? were more than 30 years old but they have not found out why they were born they had an occupation they had a life they were married but they have not found out why they were born and for the first time Jesus will speak and the meaning of their lives will be communicated he said follow me and we make you fishers of men so the reason these guys were born was not to fish fish but to fish men they never found it for more than 30 years. They were married men. They say, follow me. Follow me. There is a voice. Every man must hear for his life to have meaning. If you have not heard it, men may clap for you, but you will be light in heaven. The men that truly live their lives, Jesus calls them overcomers. It is angels that clap for them. They have rank. They have fame. They have popularity in the spirit realm. It doesn't matter the occupation they were doing, but everything they did counted in heaven. You must not be on the microphone. In the political corridor, you can be more popular in heaven than an apostle. In the market, you can be more popular in heaven than an apostle. It is not title based, it is ordination based. Why were you born? A lot have not discovered it. So they live life pursuing opportunities. They live life pursuing chance and luck. They live life pursuing privileges. A young man of 30 years graduated from school. He is waiting for an uncle to call him and say, come to Lagos. And then he leaves for Lagos and he thinks he has begun to succeed in life for 30 years. You don't know why you were born. There is an error. There is a cardinal deficiency in the way we were trained. 40 years old. How are you doing? We are managing. We are trying to survive. Because to him, it's when there is money in his pocket that life begins to count. What a shame. 30 years old. What are you doing now? Nothing. He may even have a job. But every Friday, he squanders his money in the club. He said he's having fun. He has not even had enough sense to understand why he has resources. 30 years old. There's a deficiency. On campus, 90% Christians go to the lecture hall on Monday. You find 50% naked. But they are going to church. They have not understood the meaning of life. They don't even know why they come before the Lord. They think it's a religious practice because they carry them from age 1 to church with their parents. They went to church every Sunday. So Sunday is a, is a church business. They just appear with their best dress, come to church. And the moment they are leaving church, their real life begins to manifest. Very calm and sober in church. Walk to take the Holy Communion and two hands are like this. Come to give offering and they are sober. But on Monday morning, the lady becomes a slave queen as they are called. 168 hours in a week. They spend three hours in church as fake people and spend 165 hours living as daughters of Jezebel. That's who they really are. A young man's processing in the mind, everything about his mind is about pleasure. A man who is supposed to define the meaning of others 
a man who is supposed to be a trailblazer and chart the course for others. Truly, we need a revival. Much activities in church, many churches, many pastors, but there are no burning ones. Leaders, pastors, over one billion Christians. 2.6 billion Christians in the world. But you cannot enter any of the mountains of influence and say there is a pillar burning. But one man will rise in Israel by the name John. And Jesus will come and say he was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing to dwell in his life for a season. He said the whole of Judea, the whole of Judea and Jerusalem went to one man in the wilderness. No title, no occupation, but he just stayed there because he discovered that according to what was written concerning him, his name in the spirit realm is the voice of the one crying. So when you ask him, who are you? He will not tell you I am John. They gave him John in time. He knows what his nomenclature is in heaven. Who are you? I'm the voice of the one crying. That's how they know me in heaven. So on earth, his voice kept echoing. Echoing from the borders of the wilderness. And the whole city will go to hear him. He was not telling them they will prosper. He was crying against their iniquity. But they could not resist him. Because everything he was doing was written concerning him. What will happen if 10 of us discover who we are? On this small campus, what will happen if 10 of us discover who we are? Somebody met John Wesley. They had to drive him from the whole city. Nowhere to open a church or preach. The only land they had was his father's grave. And he went and stood on it. You couldn't drive him from his father's grave. And there he gathered the whole city. And somebody asked him, How are you able to do this? And he said, I set myself on fire. The people come to watch me burn. How beautiful it is when a man discovers who he is. To ask people, Why are you here? Who are you? They begin to define themselves by what people say about them. I am Dr. Matthew. I am Apostle Peter. I am the dad. But nothing to show that the supernatural realm backs them up. We need a revival. We need a revival. It's a shame for me to call myself a Christian. And the guy who is in my room, my Christianity has not impacted him. And every day I stand up, I gather myself around people that believe in what I believe. And then we are, we are, we are hailing ourselves. Hey, man of God, oh boy, the prophet of God. Meanwhile, your roommate doesn't notice that anything is happening in your life. Apostle Peter, Apostle Joseph. But the small cubicle where you are living, you are three. You are the only one that knows Jesus. You come to make noise say that you are speaking in tongues every night. But nothing from your life affects them. It's a shame we don't evaluate ourselves. We are so impressed by what we do. But the world doesn't even notice what we are doing. You come to church, they say they are praying, they are praying at the garden. And ten of them, gaba, 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 wah, wah, wah. And then they are falling down, they are rolling everywhere. The next corner, five meters away, somebody is, is romancing again. He doesn't even notice what they are doing. He gets up. Hey, hey, God is coming. They don't even hear you. Won't you go back and, and, re, and reappraise yourself? I am, I am a prophet. I am a prophet. Every two years, somebody dies in your family. You are pursuing men of God and you have been a Christian for ten years. We need a revival. The devil is having a few days because men have not woken up to the dictates of their ordination. When I look into history and I see the men God used, most of them had no charisma. Most of them didn't look like it. Most of them were obviously weak and frail. I looked upon Catherine Coleman's picture. I kept looking at her. I said, how can this woman shake the world? How is it possible? Then I understood 
that the reason we are failing is because we are full of ourselves. We have not come before the Lord with an honest heart. We need a revival. We say we have everything, but we have nothing to show. What an irony. Before you cough, he says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Before you cough, he says, I know who I am. I know who I am. Nothing to show. Nothing to show. And he has been saying, Darkness in the land. Darkness in the family. Meanwhile, a girl of 10 years is initiated into witchcraft. And that night she begins to fly. That night she can wreck a family. A girl of 10 years in the witchcraft coffin enters a family and she destroys the whole family. You will bring a band of prayer warriors. They can't even deliver her. We carry big Bibles. And when we walk, creating impression among ourselves, it's a shame. We need a revival. How was that year taught the ways of the spirit? Her mind is not even yet mature. How was she taught the art of spiritual dynamics? That at the age of 10, she knows what to say and somebody dies. How was she able to grow in that level of wickedness? That she can wipe out the whole family in so much dexterity, skill and intelligence. You can't even discern it. How do these people teach their protégés in the negative supernatural? That we come and shout in church for many months and somebody who is struggling with adultery, immorality, drunkenness, lying, cannot stop. Meanwhile, an innocent 10 year old girl, a witch just meets her and in one week, she's already a witch. How do they teach their own people? How do they do their own business? That they become so proficient. And we will keep running religious routines. This is why we cry. We cry. Sometimes I come to church. While you are greeting the people. People are already falling everywhere. And then I look to heaven and I ask God. What will become of these people after they are falling? When they fall and they rise up and they go home, what will become of them? Preachers have become even so precious. Precious that they come for meeting until people fall down and they have not done anything. What becomes of these people? After they roll on the floor. I went back to the hotel yesterday and I told God, You are talking, people are running everywhere. Screaming. I said, Lord, touch their hearts. I'm tired of the show. Touch their hearts. What was it that Peter did? That Peter will speak to people. He was not even preaching. He just told them about Jesus. The same Jesus you crucified is today exalted both as Lord and Christ. And the Bible said their heart was caught. And 3,000 people gave their hearts to Christ. Why did he speak that language he spoke? One man goes to stay in the wilderness and the whole city goes to meet him there. Here we have meeting, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, everywhere. But we cannot command the influence that these men commanded when they had no publicity strategy or material. We need a revival. You ain't, you ancient Zion king, Kado Oskado, you are mighty on your throne. You ain't, you ancient Zion king, Kado Oskado. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion King. Kadosh, Kadosh. 
you are mighty on your soul. A man carries this microphone, preaching for more than 20 years, and he's living in immorality for more than 10 years. And then you come to carry this microphone, and you are telling people about righteousness. He doesn't know the fear of God. You are warning people, challenging people, talking to people about the wrath of God. Meanwhile, you are a preacher in immorality for seven years. And then they catch them. Then you come out and say, Guinness, to win the sentiment of people. How were you able to preach all those years? Do you know what you are talking about? We read Bible and we think it's about Bible. We talk Bible. The men that walk with God, that the Bible says we should look upon as an example. In their days, there was no Bible. The Bible said Enoch walked with God and was not. He said God bore him testimony that he pleased him. There was no scriptures. How did he know how to walk with God? He said when God warned Noah, he moved out of reverence and built the ark. And he said by it, he became the heir of righteousness that is of faith. How did he know the fear of God? He was not reading any document. He said, when Abraham, God called Abraham, he moved. How did he know obedience? How did he enter into the protocol of faith? Had he not read any document? We reduce spiritual things to traditions, to dogmas, to acts and philosophies. A man is coming to talk about revival, whereas himself is dead in the spirit because he thinks revival is an intelligent teaching. He doesn't know revival is the fire of God consuming his soul. A man who should be praying and begging God to set him on fire comes to talk to people about revival. Meanwhile, he is dead in the spirit. And worst case scenario, some people argue that there is nothing like revival. <laughs> too much knowledge philosophies have shut the gate of the spirit realm from us somebody is a Christian for 10 years he doesn't know the voice of God 10 years as a Christian he doesn't know the voice of God how have you been working the decisions you've been making how have you been making them Ten years as a Christian, you don't know the voice of God. You ask, you take a census in church and say, when was the last time God spoke to you? You will be shocked. You may not even see one hand. How have we been surviving? Meanwhile, all of us have titles. All of us are preachers on Facebook. Somebody sees something that he should meditate on to save his soul. As they see it, he's sharing it. He has not even meditated on it. He feels others need to hear it. Meanwhile, that message is for him. Sometimes I have too much burden that I can't share the word of God. I just wish we could cry and keep crying and keep crying and keep crying. Because it's as if everything has been taught. Any topic you want, click on Google, you will see five to seven messages on it. But there is no life in our spirit man. We are weak. We are weak. We say program, a man of God is coming, people gather. But eventually the man doesn't come, you know, say let's pray for five hours. You'll be shocked that even the man on the pulpit cannot stand for five hours. You ancient Zion King, Kadosh Kadu, you are my river flow, river flow.
Let the sound of river flow in your church once again. Let the sound it be seen. You know, I thought I loved the Lord some years ago. I think about six, seven years ago. Can't remember. I said, Lord, whatever I have belongs to you. <laughs> And then I received my first hundred thousand. <laughs> and then the Lord came for hundred thousand. <laughs> you know, I have this saying, I'm always saying, spiritual experience is not doctrine. Doctrine is very important. Doctrine is the only basis for preserving the heritage of God in every generation. Doctrine is what defines the borderline of our experience. Outside of truth, every experience we have is a lie or is from the devil. Doctrine is the security system that God puts in place in order to preserve a generation. But we need to journey beyond doctrine into experience so that we can really know the things that are encapsulated in doctrine. I thought I knew the Lord, I loved the Lord. Because everybody was saying, Lord, whatever you want, I will do. So we'll go for prayer meeting for five hours. We are on the wall, we are waiting. Lord, if you call me, I will not fail you. Anything you want, I will give you. And then 100,000 showed up. And the moment 100,000 came, everything I needed to do became like a mountain. <laughs> Bring 100,000. That was when I understood that love has many definitions. We need to cry. If God doesn't help you, your heart will fail you. You will think you are strong. You will think you will stand for God until something is manipulated from the spiritual realm. <laughs> Apostle will always tell us that anything that is orchestrated from the spiritual realm will overwhelm mortality. Because by reason of ranking, the immortal realm is superior to the mortal realm. That's why you can be a professor of pneumatology. But a, a boy of 15 years that knows how to manipulate the spirit realm can violate what you know. You can be a professor emeritus. But a girl of 15 years in the witchcraft kobo can make you paralyzed. Your knowledge will be in your head. But that girl is interfacing a realm that is superior to the realm of your operation. You are functioning from the soulish realm, the preternatural realm. The gear is operating from the supernatural realm. So you can recite something for two hours. She comes and makes her hand. Pop, and she releases the demon. Because she's operating from a higher realm. We need to cry and press until we break into the immortals. Until we enter into the boundary of their dwelling. And begin to define our lives from their perspective. Until we begin to see ourselves the way they see us. And we are able to manipulate the modalities that they put in place. We cannot have relevance with them. Ask the Lord to talk to your heart one more time. I will soon begin to fly. So that you are not left behind. You don't want to hear the preacher tonight. You don't want service as usual. Where you are excited, you jump and you say, Boo! Boo! This is a powerful service. And then after one week, you find yourself crying again. Because the things that you thought you overcame on account of the euphoria of the service, after three days, that excitement dies. And then those things confront you again. And you discover you didn't build up. The cure to your plague is the activation of the word of God in your spirit by the Holy Ghost. Can you ask the Lord to talk to your heart? I'm not be sharing for too long. I will just strike some calls and then if the, if the realm opens, then we will begin to move by the Spirit. River flow, river flow, let it turn a river flow in your church once again. 
let it on it be this name. River flow, river flow. Let it on, oh, river flow. In your church once again. Let it on it be this name. In every generation, God has a definite purpose. And the reason God brings us into different generations is because our appearance is dependent on the generation where our participation and role in the purpose of God is calculated into. The reason you didn't show up here 100 years ago is because there was no purpose for you in God 100 years ago. The reason you are here today is because it's in this day and time that you can future in the purpose of God. You know, it's like a movie. You begin to watch a movie. You have a major character that runs through all of the movie. But different characters begin to appear in the movie depending on when they are supposed to participate in the corporate expression of the purpose of that movie. So you can't just show up unless the time for your act is, is playing out. That's when you can teach up. So the reason you showed up now is because there's a corporate thing God is doing that you have a role to play in. You will count if you find that thing and you do it. And in every dispensation where God is working, there are definite counsels that define the borderline for that which God wants to do in that dispensation. Man that will be relevant in that dispensation must find the counsel of God for him in that dispensation. As he begins to walk by it, then he becomes relevant. The challenge is not that God has a purpose that can be achieved. The challenge is that the realm is open to other entities apart from God. If God is the only entity in this realm that determines the outcome of reality, you would have just slept and then woke up and began to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. But unfortunately, God is not the only one that is in this game. When God began the project of creation, creation was sealed from every other entity that had power and authority to participate in the game. And God handed over the key to humankind in the form of his obedience to his laws. And so long as man stayed obedient to God, creation was locked away from every other entity that had the power to participate in fulfilling their own mandate that is different from the mandate of God. But Adam did not understand the implication of disobedience. You know, when God speaks to you sometimes, you don't understand the implication. God can come to you at night and say, Victor, from today, pray in tongues between 12 and 1 a.m. You have heard stories about men that prayed in tongues and things happened. But now God has told you pray in tongues. You may think God just wants you to build your prayer life. You don't understand the implication of what God has told you to do. Meanwhile, according to the economy of God, you know he's called the Alpha and Omega. The word Alpha and Omega means beginning and end. It's not beginning and end. It means God is at the same time in the beginning and at the same time in the end. So it means God is the one that encompasses everything that plays out in expression in time. So when God shows up and says, pray in tongues between 12 and 1 a.m. And maybe at this time you were 21 years old or you were 24 years old. So you thought, ah, God wants me to build my prayer life. So you go for fellowship and you say, oh boy, God came to me yesterday and said, I should begin to pray from 12 to 1. You have not sat down to contemplate how God operates. So you thought what God told you was story. So for three months you violate it. And every night your heart begins to beat. You feel uncomfortable. You become restless. What you don't know is that whether you will become anything big in this life may be dependent on that one instruction. Because the day that you will need favor, 10 years later, you may not have the opportunity to pray. So God went 10 years into your future. And when he discovered that what you are supposed to do by favor, you cannot achieve that favor. In order to keep you in the boundary of safety, he came 10 years into the past and gave you an instruction. Say, pray between 12 and 1. 
You, in your own mundane expression, you thought God wanted you to increase your prayer capacity. You don't know that God is creating an insurance policy for your future. So for those six months, when those instructions came, you may violate the prayer. And then 15 years later, you come to where your life should be defined. And then you begin to cry, Lord, have mercy. What you don't know is that 15 years ago, Lord already released mercy. But you violated the protocol of mercy. Such was the crisis of Adam when God showed up in the garden of Eden. He said, do not eat this fruit. In the day you eat of it, you shall die. Adam did not even know what death meant. Maybe his own expression. You know, Adam had some level of understanding. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 19, the Bible said, God asked him to name the animals. And he said, every name that Adam gave the animals was the name thereof. That means, to a very large extent, Adam had the power to tap into the boat of Zion and to peep into things that were locked in the chambers of heaven. So Abraham, Adam was operating at some level of wisdom, at some level of insight. So when God told him, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. Perhaps he thought that death was cessation of life. Perhaps he thought that death was departure from mortality. He didn't understand what God meant. When God said, if you eat this fruit, you shall die. He didn't know that the key of all the realms of God hinged on that instruction. The day Adam ate that fruit, that day, he handed over his authority to Satan. Satan became the god of this world. Adam never realized that while he was in this world, he was a god. So death was beyond cessation from mortal body. Death was actually dethronement of spiritual authority. Death was actually stepping away from ordination so that another entity can walk into it. So when God gives an instruction and you violate it, you may think you will come back later and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you cry from morning to night. And because you release tears, biochemical processes take place and then you are relieved. And you say, oh, thank God, I'm forgiven. And then you go back to the fellowship, you carry the mind, you say, go, go. <laughs> you didn't know that because you violated that authority, something has happened. Somebody else has been coronated. That assignment you were carrying out was a throne in the realm of the spirit. The law for sitting on that throne was what God told you. That looked like a one sentence statement. Yes, you will ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you. But what has happened? You have lost your place. Did you know why the Bible says giving no place to the devil? Because a place is where you stand and you exercise spiritual authority. So Adam thought eating the fruit was just an act of disobedience. That forgiveness can remit him with. But what happened to him is that he lost his place of authority. So when God showed up in the garden, God could not find Adam anymore. Where Adam was standing in the spirit realm, he had lost that place. It was Satan that was standing there now. So God showed up. He said, Adam, Adam, where are thou? Adam said, I hid myself. No, you can't hide from God. What has happened is that you have lost your place. So the authority you have to preserve the earth has been taken from you. So when Satan came to tempt Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, he said, bow down to me and I will give you all that you see and the glory thereof. For it has been handed over to me. So what gave Adam authority over the earth? That was what he, he, he bargained away when he decided to disobey God. As if that was not enough. <laughs> Satan did not only come into the world, he came with all his government functionaries. Death was one of them. Because Adam did what? Violated a simple instruction. These are some of the things that people are not taught. So you think you can fornicate because you felt, oh, I couldn't stop myself. And then you ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you. But there are things you will never enter in life again. Not because God is wicked. But things are at different energy levels in the spirit. There, is, there are certain things you do that your soul can no longer ascend to touch realities that are in high energy levels. Hope you know the Bible says, when we wait upon the Lord, we mount up with wings like the eagles. When you come high, you become like God. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28, it said, God is the only one. It said, have you not heard? Have they not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not, neither is he weary? He said, he giveth power to the faint, and unto them that have no might, he increases strength. So, according to that scripture, God is the only entity that doesn't know how to faint. 
He doesn't know how to be weary. So even if God works for one year, the more he works, he will be the way he is. God can't faint, he can't be weary. But man naturally has the ability to faint. But God said there's a technology in himself that when you wait on him, you mount up. So when you come higher in verse 31, he said you will run, you will not be weary. You will walk, you will not faint. So there is a place in heaven, there's a place in a height in the spirit that if a man can get to, then he can begin to function like God. Now, there are certain things you do, just the way if you wait on God, something happens to your soul and your soul ascends. And you can begin to walk in possibilities that are only prerogatives of God. There are other things that if you do, instead of your soul ascending, your soul will deplete. The ability to walk and not faint and run and not be weary, it's in the place in the spirit. When you wait on God, you go to that place. But there is also another thing. When you do certain things, your soul deplete. And then you can no longer walk in dimensions that were your best right. You can no longer walk in dimensions that are your heritage. So this is why every hour we cry for revival. Because we know that there is something God wants to do in this generation. That there is an energy level we must hit in the spirit before we can achieve it. When the devil comes to fight you, he will not waste his resources on every part of you. The devil will look for that thing that will make it possible for you to fulfill the agenda of God. That is what the devil will fight. That is why our battles are different. Somebody else's battle is lying because there's a trigger on his tongue. Somebody else's battle is immorality because he has the eyes of an eagle. The devil wants to blind him in the spirit. If he's blind, if he lies, he should pray for money tonight. He cannot do what God wants him to do. The guy that is three guys on his tongue, if his tongue is corrupt, no matter what he do, he cannot fulfill the agenda of God. Somebody else is three guys in his hand. So when the devil comes to fight, he will fight you based on where your greatest strength lies. And if he can break it, he has crippled you. For Adam, his strength was in keeping the instructions of God. And Adam did not understand that every other thing depended on it. And he violated it. This is the trick the devil has used in every generation. And every time a generation notices that the devil is beginning to strike them on their Achilles heels, a generation begins to cry. So that help will come from Zion. Because the generation knows that if the devil is able to cripple them, then they are lost in the calendar of heaven. It's possible for a whole generation to be lost. This is why we cry revival. In the days of John the Baptist, there was darkness for 400 years. There was no prophet. God had promised through Isaiah that a prophet will rise and he will open the door for the Messiah to come. The devil knew. So the devil began to cripple the prophetic. If there is no prophet to declare the coming of the Messiah, then the Messiah will not come. I may not be able to stop the Messiah from coming, but I know the protocol. The protocol is that a prophet will announce his coming. The moment a prophet announces his coming, the door is open. So what will I do? I can't fight God in heaven, but I can stop the prophetic on earth. So for 400 years, there was darkness. There was no prophet. And so long as there was no prophet, the Messiah didn't show up. Two men began to pray. Enos, the prophet. Simon, the prophet, they began to pray day and night, day and night, until a point came, God had to promise Simeon, he said, you will not see death until you see the salvation of Israel. This man prayed until a voice rose. You know, I told you something about intercession yesterday. I say you may be an intercessor, you may not be known, but you will be shocked that the heaviest reward will rest with you. Even John the Baptist did not know that the reason a prophet emerged after 400 years of darkness was because of Enos and Simeon. Pray for their lives. I, Zacharias and Elizabeth were also praying. They were praying for a son. They didn't understand the bigger purpose. So God had no promise for them concerning what he wanted to do. But these were men that knew that for the Messiah to come, a prophet must rise. So their prayer point was about the Messiah. About the Messiah. 
and when their prayer hit a crescendo in the spirit, God released John. And the angel could not wait. Why John was in his mother's womb, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. God was urgent to do what he wanted to do. God was in a hurry to do what he wanted to do. Because for 400 years, the devil understood how to violate the protocol. There was no prophetic voice in Israel. The reason no prophet rose was not because prophets were not born, but because there was something the devil did that kept them in darkness. Hope you know that when Jesus finally came, the Bible said the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, Matthew 4, 16, he said the people that dwelt in darkness. So everybody that had a mandate that showed up was covered in darkness. You will not know what God wants to do in this territory because there may be darkness. So everybody that comes here with a potential, the devil knows what to do. Maybe your own trigger is on your tongue and from the day you enter the campus, from that day, the devil puts a gist on your tongue. And for four years, you talk that story until you leave. Everybody knows you as the biggest Barcelona fan. So the man who should prophesy the move of God in this campus is the one that analyzes everything about Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Everywhere he comes, they begin to, hey, ah, 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 see the football analyst. Then he walks like this. And then he, after two seconds, he begins to talk. In 1996, when Barcelona prayed Real Madrid, on the 21st minute, he is quoting with precision. He doesn't know that they have put a plague on his tongue. That tongue is supposed to be the trigger that unlocks the potentials of God on this campus. But the devil knows. The guy that came that's supposed to be a lead among the intercessors. Maybe what God brought him to the campus to do was to raise the Deborah generation. Because God knows that the heritage of, of, of the, his heritage on this campus dwelt with the young ladies. So he came on campus. Every lady is attracted, drawn to him. And then he thought it was about his beard. So he begins to shape the beers like this. When they are in the lecture hall, he sits at the back. And then three girls are here, three are here. All right, no problem. After the lecture, he walks like this. And then one girl holds here, another girl holds here. That is the man who is supposed to raise the Deborah generation. But the devil puts an insatiable appetite for sex in his bowels. So the devil understood that the prophetic was the only thing that could usher in the Messiah for 400 years. There was no prophet. A strategy, a protocol from the demonic realm was activated and it shut down every prophetic voice. Until two men began to cry revival. And when their prayers ascended to the heavens, God himself came and promised Simeon that you will see it in your lifetime. And John rose. The moment John rose, a revival began. The Bible said the whole Jerusalem, the whole Judea went to him in the wilderness. A revival had begun. Suddenly, the consciousness of God was awoken in the heart of people. These were people that wake up in the morning and they go to brothels. They were enjoying themselves and living their lives. But all of a sudden, the voice has risen. And everybody is heading into the wilderness. To hear John. Everybody is on his way to the wilderness. A revival has begun. Revival is a reawakening of the consciousness of God and his operation in our soul. It's possible for you to be born again, but there will be no consciousness of God in your spirit. Paul said in Galatians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, If you are dead in Christ, he said, therefore, let your mind and your affection be on the things that are above. So it is possible to be a believer, but the only thing that forms your consciousness is your appetite. What will you eat? What will you drink? What will you wear? When the revival begins, the consciousness of men is reprogrammed back to God. Men begin to seek the face of God, and only then can the mandate of heaven play out of time. Remember, Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is man that has the authority to bring the will of God that is in heaven to pass on earth. But when men are not conscious of God, the will of God will remain locked in heaven. The problem is that God will not lose. Because even before he began to create, he was God. When creation is over, he will still be God. It is man, it is that generation that we lose. 
This is why we cry revival. So that men can become conscious of God again and live their lives based on the command power that is in the office of the Christ. When you take a census in church, you'll be amazed what informs predominantly the consciousness of people. Predominantly. If you were to take an appraisal of yourself in the next one minute, you will know what your consciousness is. If your consciousness is not predominantly God, you need a revival. Some come on campus and they find a girlfriend, a boyfriend, and for four months, you just see them smiling. Every time they are on their phone, quack, 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 what's up? They are smiling, they are just talking. What is happening? That boy has become their consciousness. You need a revival. Some is only their exam. Your exam is your primary objective in this campus. Very important. Make it your priority. But your exam should never take the place of God. Your studies should never take the place of God. Because the reason you must prosper is so that you can be relevant in the agenda of God. It's not the agenda of God that will be relevant in your exam. There are many people that think God is out to make them pass exam. God will make you pass exam. But remember, everything you are and become should be relevant for God. Not God be relevant for what you have. If those priorities are not well defined, there will be crisis. And this is the crisis we have. Because we were not taught correctly. Somebody made a statement very profound. He said, God is not interested in your purpose. He said, God is interested in his purpose and your part in that purpose. The devil knows. When the devil gives to men, he will first of all educate them to know that everything he's giving them is about himself. And these men know they don't joke with it. Have you seen a wealthy man that got his money from the waters? Everything he has is about the devil. He will never joke with it. Because that's how spirits operate. The reason God doesn't use force on you is because God wants it to be an act of worship. If you are forced, if you are compelled, if you are manipulated, it's no longer worship. It's no longer a faith action. And the Bible said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God wants you to be the one to seek Him, not Him comparing you to Him. And that has left a lot of people in a state of marketing. Need revival. We need revival. What is your predominant consciousness? If it is not God, you need revival. That's why revival is not shouting and running. Revival is not screaming and acting in a hysteric fashion. Sometimes the presence of God becomes strong. Your emotions are overwhelmed. But it's beyond emotion, brother. When you depart and you are alone, when you are in the lecture hall, when you are in the market, what is your consciousness? What do you live for? And what can God entrust into your hand? That is revival. A point comes when God releases his spirit upon a generation. And then he commissions a generation to do what was not happening on earth before. A revival has begun. Because a consciousness has been created. Can I tell you something? God is not just out to begin a revival. It's revival is God wants to raise. It's one thing to have a revival. And people are moving after God because somebody is leaving, leaving them. It's another thing to have a clan of revivalists where everybody is burning. That's what God wants to do. So God is not bringing a revival. God is raising revivalists. So that all of us can be a clan of burning people. But it begins with consciousness. And the devil will want to destroy that thing that forms your strength. That thing that forms the block and the foundation of your spiritual consciousness. If you study the book of Acts, chapter 4, from verse 1 to 4, Peter was going to the temple with John in Acts chapter 3. They had healed the man that was born lame. And on account of the miraculous dimension of God that broke upon them, something began in the temple. And the Bible said they began to preach to the people. They laid hands on them, baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And it said that day alone, 3,000 was added to the church. And suddenly the elders, the St. Henry, shows up and arrested them. 5,000 people rather converted in one meeting. The elders came and arrested them. And what did the elders do to them? Look at the scripture. How be it many of them which heard the word believed and the number of men that were was about 5,000. 
The same message that they were preaching, something broke upon them. They preached that message, and in one day, 5,000. Go to the next verse, and see what the elders did. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and the elders and Enos the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Next. And when they had set them in the midst they asked them by what power or by what name have you done this? The man that was healed at the beautiful gate. How did you do this? They began to interrogate them. They began to threaten them. They began to rain havoc on them. So that what informed their conviction. I want to show you what the devil does to you. So that when you leave this meeting, you will know what to protect. Some of you may leave this meeting and your prayer altar will be revived. So apart from the experience in the meeting, that prayer altar that is revived is your reviver. So long as you monitor it and keep it burning, you will burn. Some of you will leave this meeting, this conference, and then the word of the Lord will come alive in your spirit. The hunger for the word will begin. Stay there. When the devil comes to fight, he will not fight everything about you. He will fight that thing that was awakened. Some of you is fasting. The hunger for fasting will be born again. The devil will come to fight it. Some of you, what will be born will be the quest for evangelism. Those are the things the devil will fight. I want to show you how the devil strategizes. In your church, once again, learn eternity between. Go to verse 8 quickly. After they had threatened them, the Bible said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means is it made, is he, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all. The man began to preach. He began to preach Jesus to them again. And in verse 13, the Bible said something. The men saw the miraculous. They could not deny it because the man that was healed stood with them. But there was something they saw in them that was the basis for their motivation. It was their boldness. They saw that the boldness these guys had, these guys have, they will take over the whole Jerusalem. And see what the Bible said. And now when they saw their boldness, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they were with Jesus. That dimension of boldness was the greatest threat. These men saw that it was not just the miraculous. The courage and the boldness these men have. We caused them to walk into fire. And that was what was lacking. And if they continue with this boldness, something will go wrong. You will leave a meeting and have an encounter. The devil will know that if you continue with this hunger for prayer, something will happen. So when he comes, he will fight your prayer altar. The devil can begin to bless you that time. You don't understand. I told you there is a politics that go on in the realm. If the devil sees that your attention has been drafted to your prayer altar, the devil can make three people to begin to look for your attention. You were on campus the 300 level. You were struggling to have a girlfriend. No girl had your time. You now went for a meeting. You came back. Your altar was hot. You began to pray every night. And suddenly every evening, a lady shows up and says, Hmm, so you like this, don't forget me, ba. Where are you coming from? See, <laughs> there are times when I come and I burn like fire. But there are times when you show people the little, little secrets that they underrate. You don't forget me, but this lady has not called you for six months. Why is it now that fire is beginning to burn on your altar? She shows up on her own. You don't forget me, but And then that you don't forget me, but the devil puts an amplifier. And then you hear it. You go to lie down like this. You don't forget me, but You don't forget me, but You don't forget me.
The lady you bought 1,500 naira recharge card for that didn't send you a text to say thank you. Now you went for a meeting, you came back. There was a button to eat the word of God. And then you began reading. And then you see a text message. Hi, Peter. Are you around at all? You know the check on person again, no? And then suddenly Peter begins to think of his phone. He wants to, you want to carry the phone and the Holy Ghost says, hmm. Peter doesn't know that manipulation is already going on in the realm. You carry the phone, you want to die the number. It's as if your heart wants to melt. The Holy Ghost moves in your heart. Don't! Peter. Peter, 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 Peter is now battling between life and death. Battling between. If you make that call, you are gone. Even if heaven moves, you are gone. Because the whole support heaven has for you has already been revealed. Peter, you want to die. If you are wise, that's the time to shut down everything and begin to pray in tongues. Pray in tongues for three hours until all that emotion dies. Then ask yourself, why should I call her? Don't you notice what happened? Jesus was walking the air doing miracles. The devil was not moved. The moment Jesus said he wanted to go to Jerusalem, the devil knew he was heading for the cross. Instantly, the man that moved in the Holy Ghost, Peter, was the the devil came instantly and Peter drew Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus knew it was not Peter. They get behind me, Satan. For thou suffereth not the things that be of God, but of man. This is why Jesus survived. At the brink of time, when he had accepted to make all the sacrifice, the devil came again. Jesus will go to Gethsemane. He would mobilize prayer support, the Son of God. Mobilize prayer support. And Jesus will go and throw himself on the ground and was begging the Father. Because he knew that if abortion doesn't take place, that thing that was growing in his soul will make him violate the cross. That was the first time you will know that Jesus had a will that was different from the will of the Father. You would never have known. But there was a protocol of darkness that wanted to separate the perfect harmony that was between Jesus and the Father. And Jesus knew that there was a, it's a crisis. So he went, he stayed there until it was aborted. And when it was aborted, the same Jesus that wanted to miss in action showed up and said, let's go, the time has come. You don't know how it works. That's why you keep falling. When the devil comes, he will come for that thing that makes you to stand. The revival meeting will come for nothing unless you understand the intelligence to keep standing. The revival meeting is not so important because you fell down and cried. We know what to do to get people falling and rolling everywhere. I didn't preach yesterday. People were running everywhere. We know what to do. But precepts are the things that make people stand. A fire may come on you and it will be burning on your head literally. But if you don't know what to do to stand, in three days you will dissipate it. The devil comes for your strong bone. He said in verse 18, Mark, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 18. See what the, the Bible said they did to them. He said, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. They didn't stop them from doing their miracles. Go ahead and do your miracles. But never again preach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And in verse 20 he said, For we cannot but speak. The argument was not about the miracle. The argument was predicated upon their boldness. If this man remain bold, they will take over this territory. Let's fight it out of them. And in verse 21 he said, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all, for all men glorified God for which he has done. He further threatened them. You would not notice what happened in that scripture. But what they did had depleted the boldness of the apostles. And when they returned to their own camp, see their prayer. 
in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, the same chapter, verse 31. And he says, and when they had prayed, first of all, see the substance of their prayer in verse 29. He said, and now Lord, behold their threatenings. That arrow the devil shot had gotten them in their strongest point. Their boldness was being depleted. Behold, they are threatening and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may preach the gospel. This man had understanding on how to preserve the move of God in their lives. They knew the arrow the devil shot and they went for that arrow. Their prayers were not scattered it was effectual and well directed. Behold their threatening. Grant boldness. And in verse 31 the Bible said, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were, assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. You come for a meeting like this, the devil will fashion different weapons for different people. Yours may be on your prayer because that's what the Lord will kindle. Yours may be on your fasting. Yours may be on your giving life. Yours may be on your evangelism life. Find out what the Lord will kindle and guide it jealously. That is what will determine the destiny and the texture of your life. The Holy Ghost will do everything with your cooperation to preserve it. But if you fail to preserve it, you have already wasted the potentials of the meeting. The potentials of the meeting is not necessarily in what happens in... Sometimes we come, we judge based on what happens in the hall. That's where we miss it. What we should look at is not the life in our service. It's the life in our territory. What happens in the territory is the proof of the quality of what is happening in the hall. As we begin to pray this evening, most of you, your altars will be set on fire. Most of you, your work with God will be kindled. You need to guide it. In Revelation chapter 4, chapter 2 verse 4, Jesus gave a testimony about the church in Ephesus. He saw their manifestations. They proved the apostles. He saw the demonstration of God in their midst. He said, I have one thing against you. You have lost your first love. That's a church with the miraculous. That's a church with wonders. But they needed a revival. Their strength in heaven was not the miraculous. Their strength was their intimacy with God. God was their motivation. Before now, they didn't do miracles because they had powers to do miracles. They did miracles because they were motivated of the Spirit to glorify the Father. But they have come to a point where they have mastered how it works. So when they go out, when you challenge them, they do miracles to show you that they are anointed. God said their first love was lost. The moment the first love was lost, the activity was nonsense. Have we not come to a point where we know how to make the church excellent? So we come for the service, we know how to stage the programs. We know how to make things happen in the service. But God is not there. We do all the dancing, we do all the charade in the church, but we go out, God is not in our world. We need a revival. Going back to what really counts and what God is doing in our individual lives. There are lots of people in the church, congregation growing, but you call somebody up and you say, what is God doing in your life now? He doesn't know. Because there's no work with God. We need a revival. What is God doing in your life today? Can you point it out? You need a revival. If you can't point out what God is on, the project God is upon in your life now, you need a revival. The elders of old, their lives instruct me so much. God will come to Enoch, and the only thing God will look and speak concerning Enoch was that Enoch pleased him. Enoch walked with him, so Enoch pleased him. So Enoch guarded his work with the Lord jealously, and God will bear testimony. God will come to Noah and the only thing God will point in Noah's life was that Noah feared the Lord. There were many crazy manifestations in the life of Noah. The ark that took Noah 100 years to build. Noah saw the whole dimension of that ark in a vision. Can you beat that level of word of knowledge? The ark that he built for 100 years. All the dimensions of the ark. He was seeing it in the spirit realm and was building it. 
But when God came, He didn't speak about Noah's dexterity in his in the spirit realm. He spoke about the fear of God. And the fear of God in Noah's life became the qualitative assurance for determining what true service is. So your service will only be accepted when there is reverence in your life. So everything Noah did was reverent as far as God was concerned. Abraham's life with all the move of God. The Bible said Abraham was old and seeking in age. The Lord had blessed him in all things. Abraham was the definition of prosperity. But when God came, God looked at his feet. They knew what to keep. They knew what to guide. Because every day of their life, they know what God is doing. What is God doing in your life? A man who cannot trace what God is doing in his life by time needs a revival. Because he has lost his bearing. You can be a leader in church. God doesn't judge people by church, church ranking. Moses that saw the invisible God, when God showed up, God commended his faithfulness. He said Moses was faithful in all of the house of God. That was what Moses guided. What is that thing in your life that God can define you by? That's the revival of God in your life. Many Christians have lost it. Is it important to pray for blessings? Very, very important. But if you lost what is between you and God, you are lost. Peter came, he said, I have no silver nor gold. He said, but such as I have with God. That's a man born in. Such as I have. They supernaturalize your advantage. What is it you have with God? When we come for revival meetings, we want to quicken what we have with God. So that that thing will become the bearing, the defining factor of our lives. There are many people today who are lukewarm. The Bible said, because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So even God rejects men. It's better you are falling and you are seeking help than to be in between. Because even God will reject you. Revival is not running around on the street. Revival is the ability to commend and to bet the move of God. Born in people. Born in people. Born in people. What is it that you have to guide jealously? That's what the Holy Ghost will reveal to you tonight. As you leave this meeting, I want to show you what God will begin to do in your life. And then I'll begin to pray. When you come for the meeting, and the Lord releases the fire on you, then God carries you through a syllabus of training. I will show you in the next five minutes, and then we'll begin to pray. If you look at the stories of revival through the Bible, you will discover that all these men follow this syllabus of training. All of them. They follow this syllabus. I'll just pick a few significant revivers in the scriptures and then I'll show you how God dealt with all of these men. And then you'll discover that the reason certain things happen to your life, happen to you and in your life, is not because you are unfortunate. Some of the things you call crisis, what you don't know, they are actually syllabus in the school of the spirit. Some of the things you call affliction, if you don't know, some of them may be syllabus in the school of the spirit. God wanted to bring you to a point where you can rely on him completely. This is how God raised this revivalist. Revivalists are not born in the classroom. Revivalists are hewn from the cave of fire. They walk through the fire. They walk through the water. They understand what it means to walk through the fire and not to be born. So they can carry the flame of God to their world. They understand what it means to walk through the waters and not be drowned. It's not in the classroom you raise revivalists. I will show you what God does with them. If you look at the days of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham was in the hall of the Chaldees. According to Stephen, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7, the Bible says God had spoken to Abraham when he was in the hall of the Chaldees to leave his country, to leave his kindred, to leave his father's house. Abraham never moved. What carried Abraham from 
the hall of the Chaldees to Haran was his own father terror. So the same way all of us encounter God. Maybe yours may be in a revival meeting. Yours may be in the place of prayer. You encounter God and God wants to begin to train you. And you violate. That's the same way Abraham violated God. He said God had told him. But the man will not move. Until his father died. His father that was the source of his confidence died. Abraham was so connected to his family. That it was difficult for him to break that fraternity. So his confidence was in his bond with his family. So God wanted to detach. That's how God raises survivalists. He detaches you from everything that informs your confidence. God wanted to detach him. He said, leave your country. Leave your kindred. Leave your father's house. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Then I will bless you. He said, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by thee. But what? Depart. Detach. Be separated. An instruction Abraham will not obey until his father died. And when his father died, gathered himself and began to walk out of the land. Yet, he carried Lot. Have you not come for a meeting or gone for a meeting before and you are set on fire and God gives you the same instruction he gave Abraham? Leave everything. And then you are trying to find the justification in departing from some persons. And God insists rigidly leave. And then you fail to depart from those people until a point came that fire died. And then you went back crying and you don't find it. Has it not happened to you before? Set on fire, burning for God. He said, but you have to leave. And then you don't. I have experienced it many times. Many times. Sometimes a revival even come. God tells you to depart from a certain location. And go somewhere and retreat for some time. And then you say, okay, I will go next week. Next week come, I will go next week. After some time, the whole fire goes down. And then when there is no fire anymore, you carry to come back. And you say, we are going to a kitchen to Babalola Mountain. We will pray for seven hours. Then you come. When you finish praying, you have headache. You come back home and relax. You frustrate the grace of God. The intelligence of managing and stewarding revival. A lot don't have it. Abraham moved. God began to teach him how to make his hands strong. If your confidence remains on anything apart from God, you are not a candidate of revival. If God wants you to set people on fire, He will carry you through the coals of fire yourself. The hottest crisis of life, sometimes God will allow you to go through it. You will cry many nights. You will, you will scream. You will do everything until you are broken. Then God can break out through you. At that point, like Paul will say, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. When you see a man get to that level, a revivalist has been born. The Bible says God carried Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12 verse 7, verse 6, he said he took him to Sichem and to Moriah. And from there he carried him to Bethel, to Ai and to Bethel. You read those things, you just thought they were locations. Those things were physical locations, but they were prophetic indications of the kinds of training that Abraham went through. The word Sikem is the word shoulder. The word more is the word teacher. In the ancient days, they carried load and bodies on their shoulders. It's not now that you carry a jerry like this. Those days when you carry a, lo a luggage, a load, a body, you keep it on your shoulder and you move. They carry bodies on their shoulders. So the kind of teaching God was giving Abraham was a kind of teaching that attracted body. So he carried him through the place of the shoulder. And he was teaching him the ways of revival. Abraham went through so many crises. 
and God was teaching him. So God will stand on the subject of faith for 25 years until he believed. The guy will run to Egypt. God will allow him. When he goes there and is prostrated, then God will come and they will pursue him from Egypt. He will come back to the promised land. It's the dealing of Sikhem. You are praying to God, set this land on fire. Set us on fire. Then God brings you to Sikhem. And then things begin to go wrong. You don't know why. What is happening? Lord, what is happening? Some of us, the day we say God use us, that was the day we created the greatest problem of our lives. Because we were people that trusted in the flesh. And the Bible says, woe unto the man that trusted in flesh. He said, the arm of flesh we fail. Every time God wants to raise the revival, he brings you into the path of seeking. He begins to furnish you with bodies. And then he teaches you the way of the spirit by bodies. You will stay there until you master that syllabus. And the point comes as you gravitate from that place. You will learn a new technology that is beyond what you know. Maybe the technology you know now is the technology of phone call. So every time there's a crisis, there are four uncles that if you call to, something must happen. So you call Lagos. If Lagos doesn't work, Portacot will work. If Portacot doesn't work, Abuja will work. You are a master of the phone technology. You will never be on fire. When God wants to walk, then he separates. He brings you to seek him. And then all of a sudden, you want to call Portacot. Then things go wrong. You call Lagos, things go wrong. You call Abuja, things go wrong. Then you will come for the first time and you will look to the God of heaven. That time you are ready for school. That time your territory is about to be delivered. It is a strategy that God uses for every man that he uses in all generations. Those bodies will keep you there and you will cry many nights until a point comes you will learn something that does not have its root in the bearing of human civilization. The moment Abraham left Sikhen, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 that he built an altar. For the first time, Abraham had learned another intelligence that was different from fraternity with family. Before this time, the confidence of Abraham was in the fact that he lived in oneness with his family. He could not understand what God wanted when God said be separated. What God wanted to achieve through Abraham would only be possible on the strength of his intimacy with God. For so long that family was in the line, that level of intimacy that can bear dimensions of God in the extreme was not possible. So God carried him to seek him. When Abraham passed the test of seek him, the only thing Abraham knew to do was the technology of altars. So the Bible said when Abraham left seek him, he built an altar unto the Lord. At this point, he had found a new family. His family had migrated from earth. He had now built another fraternity in the heavens. Did you read the Bible? When the Bible said, we the family on earth and in heaven. Abraham had found a new league of fraternity. He had come to understand relationship with spirit beings. It was this lifestyle that he began to live that brought him to a point where he was able to separate himself from Lot. And he separated himself from Lot and God appeared again. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 18, the Bible said he departed to the plains of Mamre and there he built an altar. Altar now became the lifestyle of Abraham. Abraham go, went nowhere unless an altar was built. And every time Abraham departed, he removed his tent, but the altar remains there as an eternal memorial. That was how Abraham secured the boundaries of Bethel. Bethel was not taken over by intelligence. It was taken over by the technology of altars. Abraham littered Bethel with altars. Everywhere Abraham went, he raised an altar. This time around, he had learned how to live apart from his family. You may not know how to live away from masturbation and still have excitement in your soul. So the only thing that gives you pleasure will be masturbation. So you'll be a slave of masturbation for five years. You may not know what pleasure is unless you have a girlfriend that you call every 5 a.m. in the morning and she tells you she loves you until you understand how to service the fire of God in your life. Abraham came to a point in secret and he understood that for him, pleasure was the way of altars. So he began to litter everywhere with altars. And in Genesis chapter 18, from verse 1, the Bible said, Abraham saw men standing in the plains of Mamre. Instantly he knew that these ones are my family members. He didn't need anybody to introduce them. He said, Sars, Sars, come. 
Instantly, he prepared a banquet because these ones, they don't look like the men in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. These ones came from heaven and by altar, he has built a new fraternity. So when he saw them, he knew that these ones are my fathers. These ones are my brothers. He invited them into the house. Immediately, he went and created a banquet. He had known something that could not be taught him within the borderlines of mortality. He learned it in secret. That the only way that the commandment of God can come to pass in his life was to create a new order of lifestyle, the way of orders. Such was the pattern that Abraham created. Because he knew the only way you can leave your family and still have a family is by orders. So his family migrated from earth to heaven. And when men came from heaven, he knew them. You want to leave masturbation? They, so long as that masturbation remains, you will fall down in church ten times. That masturbation will rob you of fire. It will rob you of fire. And when the Holy Ghost wants to break it, it may not be by anointing. You will be praying, Lord, help me. Then God carries you through a circumstance. And as you obey him and follow, you want to ask for help, you say, no, pray. You go through that circumstance. You want to ask your father. You want to ask your uncle, you say, no, pray. And as you are walking through that circumstance, when you come out on the other side, then you will now ask yourself, when was the last time I masturbated? You had passed through sickness. So the body has been lifted. You have taken upon yourself the body of God. That's how God preserves fire in the life of people. And this is the technology of preserving the fires of revival. Every man that God used to steward the revival must go through the path of separation. It's the teaching syllabus of seeking. And every time they came out, they learned something that had a supernatural foundation. For Abraham, it was the way of all tasks. When Moses, God wanted to birth revival in, in Egypt, he went to a man called Moses. The guy was in the course of Pharaoh as a prince, I told you yesterday. God carried him into the wilderness. And for 40 years, a prince that was served all his life became a shepherd. He was carrying sheep to the, the desert every day and coming back. Do you know how frustrated the guy was? Sometimes he would sit down and say, is this me? When did I get here? God was teaching him. God was teaching him. Because the men he was coming to stir up, they behaved like animals. The only way he could master how to handle Israel was to go and train animals for 40 years. He would think, what's going on here? What am I doing here? They didn't know that he was walking through the chamber of destiny. And when he came out from there, he could carry 3 million people from Egypt that knew nothing. And God would tell him, teach them laws. Teach them ordinances. Teach them statutes. They knew nothing about God because even their patriarchs had no structured system of relating with God. Moses had to come with a new kind of intelligence of training people that were in bondage in a strange land, under strange cultures for 430 years. How do you begin that? Except as he went through the gate of separation. And in Moses' experience, God reduced him to a point of being a shepherd. That was when he gained the skill that was needed to activate a revival. You are hoping that God will use you as a revivalist in your time to set men on fire. You will never escape this job. The process of making of a revivalist. The pathway of seeking. We come to pray and when we leave the prayer meeting we do what we want. We don't understand how spirits work. God will walk, walk himself into you so much. He will chisel your soul until a point come when even when you cough, you cough God. You don't know how you get there. But you have walked with him until nothing else counts. Everything that was important to you, God breaks it off your life. For Paul, God appeared to him in an open encounter. Hope you know that all these men had graphic encounters with God. So encounters don't create revival. It is walking through process that brings about the ability to orchestrate revival. All of them had encounter. Abraham had encounter with God in Mesopotamia. There was no revival. Moses had encounter with God in Horeb. No revival. God walks himself through a man. Paul said when he pleased the Father, 
see, to redeem his son in me. I conferred not with flesh and blood, but I went into Arabia. What do you mean? Jesus has been revealed to you. What are you separating yourself to do again? Because process has to come in. And when he came back from Arabia, everywhere he went to and spoke, they said, this one is a God. They said, the gods have come among men. You violate process, you want to become something. You are a joker. We can have many meetings on this campus, but until men are taught how to bend their neck and allow God to walk himself into them, there will never be revival. We can psych ourselves in church, but if we want to see the true texture of our corporate persona, it's when we visit our markets, visit our offices, visit our campuses. That is when we will know whether there is revival in the land. Did you read about John the Baptist? In Luke chapter 1 verse 80, the son of a priest, the Bible said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. You can be walking in the bank, but you'll be in the wilderness. God knows the laws that he will subject your soul to. You may be in the bank and God tells you that in this bank, you will never take bribe. And many times you have problem with your manager, but God is trying to create revival. You will be hated, you will be fought in that bank, but you will follow that law until it's complete. Witherness is not idleness. It is coming under government until God walks on your soul and purifies you. He said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Our generation is a generation that runs from process. We come for the fellowship, we look for vacuum, and then we want to take advantage of our natural charisma. Because the guy is a talker. He thinks he's supposed to succeed the next president. God is not looking for talkers. Because she has a good voice. She thinks she's supposed to lead the choir. God is not looking for good voice. If his good voice is looking for, the angelic realm would have sufficed. Have you heard an angel sing before? You will know you are playing here. What makes the difference between your worship and the angelic worship is that in you is the nature of God. So every time you lift your voice in worship, you are releasing incense that is the nature and the essence of God. And a man who God has not purified cannot release virtue. He cannot release the nature of God. We teach men to bring their shoulders so that God can put his body. That's when there is hope for a generation. What body are you carrying for the Lord? You cannot trigger a revival. You can never trigger a revival. You are smart with God. God comes this way, you go this way. God comes this way, you go this way. He will always give you bread and water, but you will never be relevant with Him. When you go to eternity, then you will discover that the reason you came into the world was to bet a process, but you never created it. Everything about John had one definition, to make the way for the Lord. What if he went back to eternity and he never did it? But how did John get to know it? It was in the pathway of process. He said, the one that appeared to me, the same said unto me, upon whomever the spirit descends and rests is the Messiah. So John did not come baptizing because the, the Pharisees were sprinkling water on people. They called him John the Baptist because it was a new strategy, never existed. And the quality of his work was not the way it was because it was novel. It was the way it was because it was by instruction. It was by commandment. The reason he was baptizing was because it was a strategy of identifying Jesus. So he didn't come to do it because everybody is doing it. That was the only way he could recognize the Messiah. He walked in this thing until even his own eyes became open. When he saw Jesus, before baptism he knew him. What we call growth is strange. We call growth the number of cars we have. Then spirits will come and they will be wondering. This guy is a prophet. He has not scratched one-tenth of his prophetic calling. And he says he's made. 
The angels that work with you will stand like this. This guy is supposed to be a governor. Look at him selling clothes in a bar. He has not even noticed that this thing is on his life. Then the angels will look at you and shake their head. And then you go for a meeting, you do like this. And they say, who are you? They say, my name is Nathaniel. I'm studying biochemistry. I'm in 300 level. <laughs> they said to John, who are you? John invoked a prophecy that lasted for 700 years. Who told him he was the one? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. I am the voice. I am the voice. Who are you? Do you know the implication of saying you are the voice? If you say you are the voice, then they will say, where is the desire? Because the job description of the voice is to identify the desire. Even that one, he said, the one that sent me, the same said unto me, upon whomever the spirit descends. See how men walked on earth. See how men walked with God. And then you are living by trial and error. And you think you will be relevant. These were men without the Holy Spirit. See the degree of accuracy with which they walked. The girl is singing in church. She thought it's about position. So when they say new, there's a program. That's when she buys new high heat. Where's new we go? She sings it. She's doing like this. And then she carries a very high pitch. <laughs> ah! Meanwhile, like I always say, inside that girl's voice, there is something God planted. So that every time she lifts her voice to heaven, the angels that activate the gifts of the Spirit begin to walk. So every time that girl sings, a prophet is supposed to arise. A healing evangelist is supposed to arise. But she has been singing in church for 20 years. Not one gift has been activated. Because she thought it was about skill. So she sings the song, she tweaks it, she tweaks it. She bends her voice. She does the tongue and they say, Oh boy. Ha! Sarah, you gave voice. They say, It's the grace of God. Meanwhile, every time she carries the microphone, all the angels are at last. They are waiting for her to touch him so that they can begin to walk. But those angels have stood for 20 years. None of them have walked. Now, even when she's singing, they are relaxing. They know she can't touch him. The day revival begins, that day she may lose her voice because she was praying in tongues for 10 hours. But she comes to church as she said, Hallelujah. People begin to see in the spirit. People begin to see. People's hand, oil begins to flow. That day she has come alive in Zion. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. 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 That day nobody may be excited. But somebody will leave that meeting. And then the person goes to the hostel. And they say, Nathaniel is sick. And then suddenly faith moves in his spirit. And says, be healed. That faith that was stirred in the spirit. It was the voice of that girl that activated that faith. Because she had come alive. The guys enter the family. In their family for the past nine years, every two years, somebody dies. And today, for the first time, he enters the house. And then he just feels there's something by the door. He has never had that perception. But she attended this meeting where this girl was feeling. And his spiritual senses was activated. And he goes to the house. And then he shuts the voice of that altar. And death ends. Because a girl discovers her potential to the spirit. At every time she sings, she activates gifts. So for that girl, when she's coming for the crusade, others may be making their head. There's nothing wrong with it. She can make hers. But before she comes to that microphone, she will make sure that her spirit is saturated with the Holy Ghost. Even though she has a good voice, she understands that in the scales of the sanctuary, her value is not rated on the texture of her voice. Her value is now rated to the degree to which she can download it. So she will pray in tongues for five hours before she holds the microphone. She has understood priorities. Such people, their name echo in heaven as popular citizens of Zion. Men walking on earth, but fulfilling purposes that were born in the heights of the heavens. Jesus said, 
he is come to do the will of the Father. So when you see Jesus, you see the Father. Jesus came to reveal God to humankind. Why are you here? Everything you pursue is legitimate. But it will not count unless you find out what God wants you to do. Because the day every one of us realize what we are born to do and begin to do it, that day the move of God begins. That's why God stares men up. Yours may be prayer. You think it's just to hide somewhere and pray. <laughs> that prayer you are praying is generating energy for something else to happen on the altar. Yours may be business. You are skill for business. So you wake up, every, anything you touch begins to prosper. People can't see the business opportunity, you see it. And then you make all kinds of money. And when the church wants to go to TV and you are the one that sponsors it, you may not be praying, but what God put in your heart is the skill for business. Yours may be intelligent. You are in the lab 24 hours, discovering the survivor. Yours may be on the political corridor. You know how to manipulate power. So you are the one that will pack the bee that the church should become an institution. Reviver. This is not puppet we are talking about. This is the move of God. Because men have gone through the pathway of process and they have discovered who they were. When God appeared to me and told me he would make me an apostle to the nations, I was 12 years old. I thought that would happen the next day. <laughs> My training process took more than 13 years. The last, the last one that happened to me, sir. My friend, we were living together in the same house. We were in a two-bedroom apartment. He had one bedroom, I had another bedroom. Both of us were sons of Apostle Romeo, sir. A very good man. Till today, if I would point at somebody and say, this is my elder brother, he's the one. He was the one God used to chisel me. This guy runs a campus church. And when God began to separate me, I started going on periodic fast, 21 days fast, 21 days fast. I was running the schedule until I hit somewhere in the spirit. And then I saw him in a vision. And the word of wisdom that spoke to me in that vision was for me to join myself to him. So I came to his church. Before then, I was attending another church. I came to his church. After the first Sunday, second Sunday, I now walked to him and said, well, I think anything that you would have me do, I can just be here and serve. Both of us ministers in remnant. Both of us friends. Both of us living in the same house. You know what this guy did to me? The guy carried me by the hand like this and took me to the ushering unit and said, I should join the ushering unit. Me and you are ministers in remnant. We are friends. We are living in the same house. He said, I should join. And then he looked at me and said, Yeah, here, he likes people to grow through the ladder. Grow through his ladder. Me and you are starting up for far You are saying as you grow through the ladder in the campus church. I had my master's degree. This guy was still a student. I came to church. And then I only wore suits. Double breasted suits. I will come to church. I will stand like this. They will now say, hey, brother, come. Then I will realize I was the one. And I will run and collect the offering basket. As I'm giving the offering basket, I'm in another world. Is this me? What's happening here? I don't know where to put my face. And then the worst part, they will have program and invite ministers or eminence who are my colleagues. And then when they come, see the way this guy is standing, I will stand like this. That was in 2017. <laughs> that was when I understood that there was a place that is deeper than doctrine. You think you are humble, you think you are broken, you think God wants to use you, you are a joker. I did that thing for one year, eight months. That was when God now touched his heart. Then I will come to church. Then I should sit with him in front. I wanted to say no. What do you mean sit between the front? After you have humiliated me, you now say, I would have failed the test again. As I wanted to utter it, the Holy Ghost moved in my soul. And I respected myself quickly. But a point came. As I did that thing for like six months, it became normal. I will be serving, I won't even notice how many. Sometimes they will organize a meeting, I will go and preach. Some of his brethren will attend. The power of God will scatter everywhere. 
they will come to church and say, sa, sa, sa. They will be so. Is this you? Is you? Sometimes they will meet me. They meet me and say, sir, we didn't know. We didn't know. Some people that you are giving them bellows, you know. You know how rude and arrogant students are. <laughs> okay. One year, six months, God was purifying my soul. And it was my brother he used. This is a very good man. Loving and humble personality. But God moved in his heart. He said, put him in the ocean unit. I was there for one year, six months. Somebody says, seek him. It's called seek him. They teach him some body. They did him some God. That's what creates fire. Eternal and everlasting in your soul. The pathway of process. That God brings you into. In order to destroy the effect of the fall in your soul. Those places where the devil will come and place demand. God destroys that foundation. So when the devil comes, there is nothing to hold on to. So Jesus said, the prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. You know why? He went to John to be baptized. He said, suffer it to be so for now. Thus, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. How can creator go to be baptized of creation? Humiliation. You will call it. But God was teaching humankind the way to power. The way to spiritual authority. The way to move in the hand of God was for a man to come down and submit to the government of God. This is why we cry in church. God genuinely touch us. We fall under the anointing. But nothing about God lasts in our lives. Because the stability that God wants to create in our soul through process and dealing with it. So God wants to do something. Pride we approach it. God wants to do something lies, we uproot it. God wants to do something masturbation, we uproot it. We keep crying periodically, but no results. It's because we violate the protocol of deal. Sikkim is a path that everyone follows. He said in Isaiah 51 verse 1 to 3, He said, Hearken unto me, all ye that love righteousness, all ye that were hewn from the people. He said, Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bore thee, for I have called thee alone and blessed him. I have called him alone and blessed him and increased him. The path that Abraham followed is the path that all of us will follow. That is why even Jesus, the Son of God, when he came, he followed that path. The Holy Ghost drove him through pathways of dealing until the Bible said he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Your title will become nothing unless you subscribe to the school called Sikkim in the spirit. Where God places legitimate burdens on your shoulder so that he can chisel himself into your soul. Your prayer will have no power unless you have known the way of Sikkim. That's how God makes warriors. I told you, the idea is not just to create revival. The idea is to raise a clan of revivalists. And if we must be a clan of revivalists, all of us must pass through the pathway of Dili. That's where your addictions will break. That's where your fears will break. That's where the hand of the devil upon your life will break. Nobody manifests overnight. I went through that school many times. And when God graduated me from there, he came to me and said, I will begin to announce you. And I released my messages and in 14 days, my messages were in 17 nations. 17 nations of the world. In 14 days, I received four invitations in the U.S. What was I saying? It's the same thing I was saying for 13 years. But after process was complete, God now released the angels and they began to blow their shofar in the spirit. So when you say, Jesus is Lord... People hear it and it echoes into their heart. Because your soul has become a conduit pipe that can steward the dimensions of God. Paul said, for that we loved you, we have not only communicated the gospel, but the substance of our soul. Hope you know when the leprous guys were going, their steps became like the sound of a chariot. When God deals with a man and he is refined, if that man speaks, the angels that walk with him echo it. They echo it through the earth. Did you read about Jesus? After he left the mountain of temptation, the Bible said his fame went abroad. That's why John could speak from the wilderness and the whole nation will go to him. There was a mystery in the spirit that was amplifying his voice. And every time he spoke, 
the angels gave it a thousand voice. So one man speaks, it becomes like the voice of many waters. You will carry the biggest speakers in your conference. And you will scream and speak in tongues and shout. Your message will remain on the shelf. Nobody will download it. Even if you pay and go to TBM. Apostles say the day you come and say hallelujah, nobody will tune in. Have you not noticed? Everybody's message is on Telegram now. Everybody is, on, is a Facebook apostle. Everybody is a Facebook evangelist. It is God that announces men. And until you yield to God, until he chisels you, your soul cannot conduct his dimensions. Tonight, we are going to first of all make a commitment to God. Before we pray for the fire of God to rest on people. It's a very easy thing to release the fire of God. But it takes a lot of time to manage it. In Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12, he said the fire on the altar must not be put out. They put every morning. We can lift the song now and release fire. We can begin to pray and release fire. We can just start talking and allow our soul to ascend and release fire. But it will take a lifetime to, to steward it. And this is why I came to show you something. I came to reveal to you this evening that the path of dealing, the path of yieldedness, the path of obedience is the only channel through which God raises a revivalist. Paul said something. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, he said, we are servants of God, therefore we are stewards of the mysteries of Christ. That means access to mystery is not a function of study. You study to show yourself approved, but to gain access to mystery, you must become a servant of Christ. A part of dealing. Many of us live for ourselves. If we take a census, you'll be shocked that there are some people here that the Holy Ghost have been troubling for the past three months to pray every night. But because the authority of God is not, is not in their consciousness, they waste all their energy in the daytime. And when they go to sleep, they lie down like this and wake up by 9 a.m. And they say, it's not my fault. I wanted to wake up. If, if that consciousness is created, in the daytime, you know how to manage your energy. There are some people here that God has been instructing to take a fast, to take a fast, but the consciousness is not there. They think fasting is a spiritual exercise. They think it's a religious practice. You don't know that your destiny and your relevance in this world will anchor on the instruction that God gives you. For Noah, he said, build an ark. For Abraham, he said, get thee out of thy father's house. For Moses, he said, go to Pharaoh. If they had violated any of these instructions, they would never have been relevant. That instruction you think is a religious activity, that may be the only thing that will define your destiny. The glory and the beauty of your life, everything God can do with you and through you, may rest on that instruction that you have violated. Many of us are violators of instructions. Many programs, many crusades, many activities, but little obedience. This evening, I want us to make commitment. I have to keep it calm so that I'll be able to talk for this long. If I allowed my soul to ascend, by now, we would have been screaming and shouting. Thank God there are still many days for the conference. Perhaps you are here this evening. And there's that one instruction that God has been on in your life. One you have not been able to obey. I came to tell you this evening that what will define your life is encapsulated in that instruction. You want your life to begin to have me. Come forward, let's pray together. And ask God for the release of grace. So that that thing that he has been echoing to you in your bed chamber that you thought was a religious instruction you will begin to commit your life to it today as if everything depends on it. And I tell you the truth. Everything depends on it. Everything. It's only God that makes men in this kingdom. And over and over again, the Bible has revealed to us these patterns consistently. Ah! How I wish we will understand 
the urgency of this call. Like fire, like the rain, let your glory fall. Like fire, like the rain, let it fall. Let your glory like fire, like the rain. Let it fall. It doesn't take anything for this campus to bow before the cross of Jesus. It only takes men that are used. The authority of principalities is the ability to manipulate spiritual laws. And every time we violate spiritual law, we give away our authority. That's why we preach there is no revival. We pray there is no revival. We worship there is no revival. Because there is disobedience in our constitution. Like fire, like the rain, let it flow. There's a prayer we are going to pray tonight before I speak over your life. When Paul met Jesus, he was walking in total rebellion. But the moment he encountered Jesus, he looked to the heavens and he said, Lord, it is. And instantly, God began to speak his destiny into time. He said, it is hard for you to kick against the priest. Your destiny has already been written in Zion. But now that you are willing to obey, the great one can speak it into time. By the authority of the office of the Christos, he began to alter his destiny. Like fire, like the rain, let your glory fall. Like fire, like the rain. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit, for another privilege that we have to congregate under the standards of your reality. Precious Father, we ask that this morning you open our eyes to understand the things that are freely given to us. And we ask, O oh God, that you give us the capacity to walk the reality of that which is known. Take all the glory, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. This morning again, it's my honor and privilege to be here to share the word of the Lord with you. I want to specially appreciate my dad in the house, God's servant, Pastor Sunday Obaka and his beautiful wife. <laughs> Who also happens to be my mama. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, when you are a young preacher, you enjoy a lot of blessings. And one of those blessings is the blessing of spiritual covering. When you have men that have gone ahead, men that have paid the price, men that are able to boast different dimensions of God, providing you blessing and covering. And this morning, I'm grateful to God to have such personalities in my dear father the house. I also want to appreciate all the elders in the house this morning. Our professor who happens to be the chairman of council. Thank you so much, sir. And everybody here, all the pastors, thank you for being the covering that our generation desperately needs. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I will be sharing the word of the Lord with us briefly this morning. I will take time to pray for a while. See what
what the, the Lord will be doing. Pastor said something, he said, we are comforted in the Lord. And that's so encouraging, you know, for someone who just walked in to a situation like this on the ground, it's so difficult, you know, to give expression to the Holy Spirit on your inside. And this morning we trust that the Lord will be helping us in Jesus' name. Thank you, everyone that is here, those who came in because of the program. Thank you for coming. God bless you. I said yesterday that this is a very rich ground, very rich spiritual ground. Most of the revelations that have changed the body of Christ in our time and have given accurate perspective to what the Lord is doing and has given us wisdom, counsel, and instruction on how to handle the things of the Spirit and to move in the Spirit, they came from this platform. Aside the fact that Dan is doing a great work here, this is the ground of Koinonia. <laughs> this happens to be the podium where the legendary apostle, Apostle Joshua Selman, ministers to the rest of the world. Such a great blessing to be standing on this podium. Uh, I stand here this morning greatly humbled, with great respect for his service to the body of Christ. You know, I was saying yesterday that I was hoping sincerely, given that Koinonia was Friday and I came in on Saturday, I said maybe I will step on some of the places where he stepped. <laughs> so that by standing here myself, we receive invitations from the servant of God. It's such a humbling experience. And we trust that this morning, again, the Lord will be giving us insight that will be particular to what He wants to do in our lives as it will give us relevance in what He is doing corporately in this dispensation. It's one thing to be very knowledgeable about the things of God, to be so vast about the things of God and to have Reading with you the knowledge of what the Lord is doing in the generation. But there is an unfortunate possibility that can be dead with such a one to know everything about what God is doing, but not to be a partaker of it. Because it's not enough to know, it only becomes enough when you have the spiritual discipline. To be subjected to the demands of what God is doing, then you can be a partaker. You can know, and the more you know, the more you become proud and calm. But a man who sustains the disposition of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit in obedience to respond to the demands of the move of God in a generation is a man that will be part of the heritage of what God is doing. Paul came to the church of Corinth. These guys had mastered the ways of the Spirit so much that they displayed different gifts of the Spirit. They understood the teachings of Paul, they understood the teachings of Apollos. So Corinth became a ground of revelation. But when Paul came to diagnose the texture of the church of Corinth, Paul discovered they were kind of Days. So spiritual knowledge, dexterity in spiritual intelligence and oratorial capacity does not directly translate to depth and stature in the spirit. So most times you come to a place where there is so much revelation and you think you will find the best quality of Christians. But you'll be amazed that that is where you find the most shallow people and then you find the most proud people who are not partakers of what God does. So it behoves every one of us to become very humble, especially where we are, when we are in a place where God is doing what He's doing. For those of us who are of the remnant family, we interact with Apostle Robert every day, sometimes on a very informal note. And then if you are not careful, because you know Him on an informal note, you become separated from what God is doing. 
people who hear about it from afar, they enter into encounters and spiritual experiences that most of the people who are on ground never have the experience of. Some become so used to these messages that they score it. But there are few others who just heard one of his messages and their lives are transformed. Even the extensive prayer exercise that we do every day in Revenant, to some people becomes a religious routine. So they know that we pray every Monday to Wednesday for three hours, and then we run meetings every Friday, and then sometimes once in a month we run prayer straight for 10 hours. So these things become religious routines. Meanwhile, somebody gets here to stay in a distant land, and a prayer movement begins. And that person in three months experiences a transformation that the one who is on ground for three years does not have. Because we become used to what God is doing. We know how the services run, we know what the Holy Ghost will do, and we know the Lamb of God. And that is why I told us yesterday that in order to maximize what God is doing, we need to go back to the message of the cross. And the Holy Spirit helped us yesterday to see that the message of the cross was the bedrock of apostolic doctrine. And I showed us from scriptures how the major emphasis of Paul's teaching was built from the cross. He said that Jews sought signs and wonders. The Greek sought wisdom. He said, but we preach Christ and him crucified. And Paul said, on the strength of that message, our faith will not be built on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. He told the church in Galatia, in Galatia, that his doctrine was such that he was able to beat Jesus Christ on the cross for them. So when you heard Paul, it was as if you were there when Jesus was crucified. And the reason for which you went to the cross became bare to you. You would understand it and you would commit your life to it. And I said there were two dimensions to the cross. The provisions of the cross and the demands of the cross. It would be impossible to experience the provisions of the cross unless you have subscribed sufficiently to the demands of the cross. It is a cardinal emphasis of apostolic teaching. So Paul narrated everything that Jesus did and the potentials of everything that Jesus did in the Gospel of Romans. And from Romans chapter 1 to chapter 8, Paul revealed what Jesus did for the whole world. In order to bring the world into the full heritage of everything God has provided. And in Romans chapter 9 to Romans chapter 11, he referred particularly to the Jews. Showing them every potential possibility they have in God on account of the finished works of Jesus. But when he went to chapter 12, he said, Therefore, dearly beloved. Therefore means what I want to share with you from now on depends on what I have shared before now. He said, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Do not conform to this world, but be a transformed by the renewal of your mind. So Paul said, separation from the world and committal of life to God is what becomes the basis of demonstrating what God has given to us. Because in chapter in verse 3 of that scripture, he said, then you will be able to show. The word show is not the same as you know. It's possible to study. He said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, he said, until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. He said, do not undermine the gifts that have been given to you by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So it is possible to know by reading. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a watchman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can read and study and have an accurate understanding of specific emphasis in the kingdom. But that you know does not mean you have the ability to demonstrate. Because when it comes to demonstrating spiritual realities, there is an urgent need for fraternity with the spirit that hosts that reality. Because it is the working of that spirit in your life that translates to demonstration. So the word know 
is the word I do become aware. He said, Whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. All things are passed away. He said, Behold, that means become aware that all things have become new. The word is I do, but through study, through revelation, through exhortation and doctrine, you can become aware. But it doesn't mean you have the ability to demonstrate. Paul said, The only time. The ability to demonstrate is given to a man is when that man comes to fraternity by paying the sacrifice of alignment. So he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He said, then you will be able to show. The word show is the word dokimasu. It means having the ability to demonstrate what you have. So on the strength of the cross, everything God has for humankind is already deposited in our spirit. But the frustration of humanity is the inability to demonstrate what we carry in our spirit. So a man knows he is the righteousness of God, but he can't understand why he's a slave of masturbation. He knows he's the righteousness of God, he can't understand why he's a slave of immorality. He knows he's the righteousness of God, but he is controlled and powered by secret sin. He can even come to a church where through commitment and zeal for the Lord, he is made a leader in the church, but in his heart, he knows he's a slave. Every time he washes, people shout, jump and cry. When he goes home, he loses his teeth, he's crying. Because he knows what he's saying, he doesn't have the ability to demonstrate it. And I told us that spirits are not interested in what we know. Spirits are interested in the economy of life that is at work on our inside. Because the life at work in our inside is manifested as spiritual energy. That energy is what changes our world. So Jesus says to be witnesses. He didn't say to be teachers. He didn't say to be preachers. He said to be witnesses. So you have to first of all become a proof of a reality before you can teach it. So we are witnesses before we are preachers, before we are teachers, before we are apostles, before we are prophets. The day we lose the ability to be witnesses, our preaching is vain, no matter how intelligent it sounds, because it will have no power to challenge the powers that be. So principalities come to contend with the quality of life you have, not the doctrine you preach. Jesus said that prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. He had not started preaching. The man knew that this is a witness. Because every time the witness speaks, the spirit of the utterance is communicated. So beyond teaching and education, he is communicating spirit. So Jesus said, the words that I preach, he said, they are spirit, they are life. You may be educated listening to me, but beyond education, I am communicating a spirit to you because I am a witness. And in order to be able to demonstrate that dimension, Jesus committed his life perpetually to the will of God. So alignment becomes the hallmark of the Christian faith. Young believers will pursue after knowledge, all kinds of wisdom in order to wow the audience. We are so zealous about showcasing our abilities. But when we grow on this ladder, we understand that obedience is more important. That's why you look at the fathers, they are calm. There was a time when they were zealous like you. But they now understand that it's not in the length of their teaching that men will be transformed. It's in the deposit of the spirit. So a man will choose to pray for 10 hours to come and share for 15 minutes. But a younger believer will choose to pray for 30 minutes to come and talk for 3 hours. Because it thinks it's a show. When you understand these things, your life will take new sets of priorities. So we say alignment is more important because without alignment, you may know what you have in God, but you will never demonstrate it. That is one of the greatest crises of humankind. We believe that God has not lied. We have faith in God, but we can't explain why. Our life seems to be beggarly. Our experiences seem to be epileptic. It's not a frustration to hear the scriptures affirm again and again 
The worst part is that we come to church and the preacher keeps emphasizing what God has done for us. He will go as far as prophesying it. But every day we go home, we know we are in the middle of frustration. What we turn the situations around is when we make up our mind to come under the government of the Holy Spirit. Because of the dimensions of God that we carry is locked up in that spirit in our inside. And the demonstration of it is called the charisma of the Holy Ghost. What you call the gift of healing is the charisma of the Holy Spirit. What you call word of knowledge is the charisma of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that gifts of the Spirit was the charisma of the Holy Spirit. So when you become pliable in the hands of God, then your life becomes a portion that the Holy Ghost demonstrates his dimension. So that time you think God is healing somebody. The Holy Ghost was actually giving expression to the flavor of healing that it is. So God wants our lives to become platforms upon which He can manifest His dimensions, theaters that reveals His essence. But that will not be possible if we still run by the economy of flesh. So we said the cross is the judgment of God against flesh, so that the flesh will die and the glory of God can be. And we said these are not things you do by zeal. Because zeal dies. The only thing that lives through you that is eternal is the spirit that dwells on your inside. So we said there are definite laws in the spirit that brings us to a place where we can allow God to flow through us naturally. So that the supernatural dimension becomes our natural disposition. It's not something we struggle and try to do. It's something we yield and manifest to us. And in order for this thing to become flawless, we say there are laws that we submit ourselves to. And this thing is true to us. I was sharing with us yesterday how that it will be such a struggle to be able to lift a, a matter that weighs 80,000 kg. But that is the exact weight of the Boeing aircraft, the airbus. Weighing over 80,000 kg. It's impossible for that matter to float in the wind. So it will be a waste to struggle to carry it. It may fall and kill everybody. You can't even get a crane to lift it to that height. It's impossible. What makes a matter of such mass existing in a frame where law of gravitation is existing to float in the air like paper? Is a function of laws. It's called the law of aerodynamics. The moment that matter subjects itself to the law of aerodynamics, the potential of flight becomes natural. And the same way with every one of us, the moment we subscribe to the law of alignment, the flow of the life of God becomes natural. We struggle because we refuse to obey the laws of the spiritual. And it results in terrible catastrophes. Because we don't know the powers that causes these things to be. When the law of aerodynamic is distorted, you know that everybody on board, they are already dead. Because you can't manage such a weight unless laws are in place. So we said, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 said, There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But how do you walk after the spirit and not the flesh when you are made of flesh? We say it is the law of life that is Christ Jesus. So it is subjection to law that makes it possible for a man to walk in the spirit. And we call it the law of spiritual life. So we listed those laws yesterday by the help of the Holy Ghost. And for those who are here, you saw that it was not something you do out of sin or out of, sin or out of fleshly abilities. It was more or less a subjection to the Holy Spirit to flow through your life. This morning, I want to show us two things that constitute the blessings of the cross. I know we've been taught these things again and again and again, but I just want to touch two of them to bring somebody another level of awareness. You know, you eat the same food every day. If you want to grow, you keep eating it. You can't come to the point where you say, I was eating rice since I was 10 years old. I won't eat rice again. I won't eat it again. 
if you stop the food. Bro, you not just stop the yoga. So even though we've heard this thing again and again and again, we will still hear it again. Hallelujah. You know, this is not church. So sometimes, it's not, we don't get to revival in nature. So that <laughs> people don't keep shouting everywhere, but they don't have principles to live by. You know, in the church setting, they are taught principles and laws. When we go for the revival meetings, we set people on fire. But you don't live by the fire you catch. How many of you want to get married and then you remember when you were slain under the anointing? And then on the strength of the slain anointing, you now say, This is my husband. <laughs> when you want to get married, you will sit down and begin to remember everything you were told. That's when you will remember that the man must be spiritual. You will remember that the man must have the fear of God. You will remember that the man must be submitted to spiritual authority. Most times you didn't hear those things from the revival camp meetings. You heard them from the church. When the pastor was talking, I looked as if it's not important. But when you want to make any decision in your life, those things that look not important, those are the things that will confine your decision making process. <laughs> so the fire keeps us burning. But the wisdom captures are the things that determine the direction that we will go. And the value of our life is a function of the quality of decisions that we make. So this morning I want to show us two provisions that will bring us another heightened level of awareness on what Jesus has paid for and how to maximize it. And then we will pray applying it this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, we've been taught basically the four major provisions that we receive on account of the cross. One of it is healing, one of it is salvation. Salvation generally includes it, it's awful. Salvation of the spirit is deliverance from the messianic judgment. Salvation of the soul is deliverance from demonic powers. Salvation of the body is what you call healing, and salvation of your circumstances is what you call prosperity. Are we together? So these are four major food salvation that we've been taught over the years. Deliverance from messianic judgment, which brings us justification in the spirit. Deliverance from demonic powers will bring salvation to the soul and salvation from sin as transformation. And then deliverance from the body, which is healing. And then deliverance from circumstances, which is prosperity. Hallelujah. But I want to give us something more elaborate that will inform our operation with more confidence and audacity. Because if you are just taught salvation from the body as healing, every time you want to approach it, you are going to be looking for the principles that work. And your lack of full understanding of those principles and how it works may constitute a deflection of the energy of your faith. And then it will become a matter of struggle. So I want to give us two broad umbrellas of what God has done that will encompass all of these four dimensions. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, one of the greatest crises of humankind from the beginning of creation was the inability to know who God was. A spirit being created the world out of nothing. And then he created the man and threw the man into the world. And he just began to relate to the man. The Bible said every morning in the cool of the day, the voice of the Lord came walking with that. So the man didn't understand what kind of species is this being. He didn't even as much as call it a name because he didn't know what this being was. So he only lived to follow the instructions of this being. So much so that a point came where the being came in laws that indicted his existence. He said, The day you eat of this fruit, of this tree, he said, You will die, die. And the man didn't understand the implication of that contract because he didn't know the being that was talking to him. What do you mean, die? Who are you? You just come to give instructions, you just want to tell me what to do, and then obviously you are the one who created all this thing. Who are you? So he followed this being like that until he failed, and through to the words of this being, he died and he died. And then the human race continued like that. So a point came where the fathers discovered that of the truth, this being was suffering. 
and his war is regulated and controlled the possibilities in the realm where they dwell. So all they did was they would look at the being when it does something that is beyond their level, that is outside of the possibilities that they are used to. They now use a name to tie to that manifestation. So this being comes and somebody is sick and the being heals the person. They know that healing is not something that humankind has the capacity to fulfill. But because this being has the ability to orchestrate the process of healing in the life of a human being, they now say, this being is called healer. This being is called what? Healer. Now, on the strength of that name that they tie to that being, every time they sought healing, they will invoke that name. So those names became principles in which the presence of God were locked. And they carried it on their shoulders and handed it over from one generation to another. So the names in which they locked the dimensions of this being became the greatest heritage that they left for their children. So Abraham, for example, walked in lack and scarcity for a long time until he contacted this being. And this being told him, just believe in me and I will give you an heir. And it took Abraham 25 years to understand that this being sustained the power to make fertile that which was dead. And the day he believed it and this being produced that dimension, he now said, this being is called El Shaddai. The meaning is that from the womb of this being, humankind has the liberty of being sustained of every form of infirmity that they have. So he handed over the name El Shaddai to his son Isaac as an eternal heritage. So when God came to speak to Moses, he said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me as El Shaddai. So the greatest heritage that Abraham handed over to his children was not the cactus that he had. It was what he caught in the spirit realm, locked in the name that he gave to his son. So every time his son walked with that name, even though the cactus were finished, even though the waters were dried up, so long as the son had that heritage called El Shaddai, he could dig wells in the dry land and water may come out. Because the El Shaddai meant having the ability to cause creation to produce. So when Abraham blessed his son, he didn't bless him with wine and corn, he blessed him with the name. This is the name by which I found this unseen reality, this being that is locked outside the borders of humankind. He has the ability to cause evil death to come back to life. Hope you remember when Abraham wrote his PhD thesis. God tried him to, be, to know whether he understood the meaning of El Shaddai. And God came to him. After he waited for 25 years to receive Isaac, God now told him to go and kill Isaac. And he said, to kill your only child, just in case you think you have others, I'm reminding you that this is the only one you have. And then he added another thing that with three cap pain in the heart of Abraham, he said, the one that you love. That was the greatest exam that humankind had to write in the days of Abraham because the posterity, the posterity of humankind rested on the seed of Abraham. So God wanted to know whether the confidence of Abraham was in this dimension of God that he has found or it was based on the things that he had at hand. If Abraham will understand the true scope and import of El Shaddai, then the powers of the El Shaddai will be really invested in that way. So he said to him, go and kill Isaac. And Abraham was wise enough not to tell Sarah because if he had told Sarah, Sarah would have migrated to Isaac. <laughs> so he carried the boy early in the morning and vanished. He said, We are going to worship God. What is worship? You want to go and kill your only child? <laughs> so we are going to worship. We are going to worship. That was the hardest example. You know, that's not kindergarten. You know, kindergarten faith is when you come and say, Lord, give me bread, and then bread shows up. You see a boy at the grove. Lord, give me car, and then somebody comes after three days. They say, I was led to give you this car. Say, Wow, oh boy, we get power, we get power. <laughs> Jesus said, This commandment have I received of the Father that I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. True power is when a man comes to a point where everything he has is willing to give it away because there is a confidence working on his inside that the God he knows is the one that suffices him of all things. That's a man who can walk into a desert and make it a forest. He doesn't cleave to the things that he has. He has a God that wherever he walks into, everything that was lacked will become a possibility because he carries something that is invisible on his inside. That man can give everything he has and go to a strange nation. He may go to heaven without money in his pocket. I heard stories of men like John Chilik. 
he was coming to Africa with his family and he had nothing. Even the money to pay for his ship fare, he had no dime. And then when he came, they killed him. And people were paying, receiving their receipts. And then he was going. They lied. It was 10 persons were left. And the guy was still going. Oh, God, you mad? People come here to present their ticket. You don't have. And you are carrying a family of seven. Where are you walking to? He's a man that knows the hell shall die. <laughs> when he walked, three persons to where they were collecting the ticket, somebody came and said he was left to give this group. He doesn't know the man from anywhere. Because a man who has El Shaddai, even creation, is sentenced to a law of supplying for that man. The air that you breathe will become a sustainer. The waters will support you. Even the land will respond. That's why God said to Isaac, stay put in Gera. Everybody was migrating to Egypt, but Isaac won. He stayed in Gera. There was no hope. But he knew the El Shaddai. So the name of God is the greatest inheritance of the nation. And Abraham caught that money and he gave it to his son as an inheritance. Why do you think Isaac will sit down and tell Jacob, I bless you with corn and wine? They don't have the gap to the laws of inflation anymore. You can live here and go to Mozambique. If a man that comes to the El Shaddai say, I bless you with corn and wine, even the land of Mozambique will respond to you. This man knew the powers that shook the foundations of the world. But they have to go through the test of alignment to enter into that scope and power of knowledge. And he sacrificed Isaac. I was trying to read the Bible to find out how Abraham answered this question. Because this question was the question that the immortal one himself gave to mankind. You know, when God wants to promote a man, he makes him an examination. The exam we write is not a revelation of human intelligence. Humankind studied the spirit realm and they fabricated everything we do from the realm of the spirit. The Bible said to Moses, he said, teach them laws, teach them ordinances, and teach them statutes. That is the foundation of human intelligence. Moses made available spiritual possibilities to the natural. So everything we do today as a lifestyle is a revelation of the things that Moses downloaded. That's why the laws of all the nations of the world were built on the laws of Moses. There's no promotion without an examination. And the kind of answer you write is what determines who you become. When I checked the script of Abraham, we discovered that Abraham wrote. He said he believed that God, who gave him this time, was able to raise him back to life in the sequel. So Abraham knew that the name El Shaddai means having the ability to cause life to come out of death. And when he wrote that question, he scored and made. <laughs> because Jesus wrote and he said, he said, men will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south to salute Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. These men, because of the way they passed their exams with God, even while they were on earth, they knew that they had a throne in heaven. How can Paul be walking on earth and say, I have run my race, I have finished my course? What is left for me now is a crown. What do you mean? When you are saying, am I saved? Am I not saved? People are back there debating whether salvation is eternal or not. Somebody else has left the realm of salvation. He doesn't just know he will be rewarded. He will tell, he's telling you the quality of his reward. You know the people that wear crowns in heaven. I don't think you have an idea. <laughs> in the whole scripture, not even the seraphims of glory wear crowns. Not even the cherubims wear crowns. The only beings that we are crowned in heaven are the 24 elders that sit on 24 thrones. So Paul is telling you that in heaven I have a throne. <laughs> it's a knowledge that you enter when you pay prices. Because you will come to a point where God will tell you that because you have rejected the world, I have become your shield and your experience the world. I am your reward. These were men that journeyed into parts that very few dared to wonder. He said, Paul and Barnabas. He said, these three the men that turned their walls upside down. The Bible says, the twelve disciples of Jesus, they said they turned the foundations of the nation upside down. You have not come to a point to make a sacrifice where you can move the hand of the heavens. Then you don't know the God that you talk about. You reign. You Revelation that means.
names are not the men they just Names are signatures of authority in the realm of the spirit. So suddenly the name Abraham became the meaning of father of many nations. Through what he entered, his name became bigger than the designation. Then the people that dwell in the walls of the Chaldees, they bear the name Abraham as a, a, a form of recognition and designation. But for Abraham, his name became a seed of authority in the heavens. So when the children of Israel cried for 430 years, God did not come down because they were crying. There was a name that had a stature that was superior to the voice of 4 million people. The cries of 4 million people was not as strong in the spirit as the name Abraham. So he said, because of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, am I come down? Names became signatures of authority in the realm of the spirit. Oh, people went to cast out devils and the sons of Sheba said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Although you have names, but in the realm of the spirit, there's no authority on your name. So we understood another dimension of name that names are not actually meant to give you identity. Names are actually signatures of authority in the realm of the spirit. So when they saw the healer, they said, He is El Shaddai. When we saw, when they saw the refuge, they said, He is Jehovah Nisi. So every time you come under Jehovah Nisi, you don't need to pray, you are covered. The moment you understand the meaning of this, you are covered. And that was why in the life of Jesus, you know he was Jehovah Adonai, he was Jehovah El Shaddai. All the names that God had was invested in one personality called Jesus. The Bible said in Colossians 2.9 that he pleased the Father, that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him body. But God wanted to promote mankind. To a place where we do not only need to go and find the meaning of El Shaddai and then we will be provided. Then when we need to win the war, we will go and look for the meaning of Jehovah Ra. When we need children, we will go, no, no, no. God wanted to give us a promotion so that through one name, every one of us, if we call it every other thing, we will respond. So the strategy of the cross was to give you a name that is both El Shaddai, both Jehovah Nisi, both Jehovah Ra, both Jehovah Elohim, both Jehovah Tikkunu. The name of Jesus became an envelope that carried the fullness of the possibility of God. So the greatest gift that the cross made available to you is a name. My friend Victor, uh, three days ago, somebody hacked into his Facebook. And when the person hacked into his Facebook, he changed his password. And the moment the person changed his password, he began to send messages to people. And there's this business, if you do this business, you will gain 50,000 in 45 minutes. So when he sent it, everybody thought it was victory. Before we knew what was happening, somebody had sent 50,000 already. If that's the power of a name, the moment they saw that message, the integrity of Victor all his life was invoked. So that message did not only carry the meaning that was written, that message carried the DNA and the signature of Victor. So the people that read that text, they were not trying to see whether this thing is logical. When they were reading that text, they were seeing the integrity of Victor. So even though he said, throw this money away, you will see it after many days. They were not hearing the, the visibility of the language. It was the integrity of who spoke that they were seeing. So in less than 30 minutes, people began to give money. The man had to run on Facebook and write a lot of disclaimers and say, this is not me. This is not me. Please, God. <laughs> it's the power of me. That's why we can throw our bread on water. Because when we hear, it is the El Shaddai that we are seeing. It's not how logical it is. He said, give your all and after many days you will find it. You, are, you will not be wanting, but what means will I find it? How is it possible? He said, call my name and every knee shall bow. You are not wanting. Is it demons? Is it principalities? He said, call my name. So the moment you hear it, you know that that name can the investment of the totality of the Godhead. But before Jesus came to the point where he gave that name to humankind, there was a price needed to pay as a man. So the name Lord was not given to Jesus the Christ, it was given to Jesus the man. Because Jesus the Christ, the fullness of the Godhead was already in him. Jesus didn't need promotion, he's God. But he had to wear the garment of man. The Bible said he stripped himself. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 9 of the garment of divinity and he took the form of man. So he paid the sacrifice in the form of man 
So the name that he has as the Son of God, that name he can now share with mankind. So the greatest blessing of the cross is that you will become the recipient of the name of Jesus. Every time you invoke it, every time you show up in the name of Jesus, even the whole elements of the spirit realm will see Jesus, not you. It's the gift of the cross. That's why when we confront challenges, we come. All you need to do is to say, I come in the name of the Lord. Because it, it was paid for you to become the recipient of that name. It's one of the greatest gifts that human can have. The authority you have in the spirit realm is beyond your sacrifice. It is just based on the sacrifice of Jesus. But you need to be aware that you are now a bearer of the authority that is in that name. This is where you receive the gift that is beyond healing. If all you know about the cross is that you have healing, because it was by his stripes for healing, you will still be limited. But if you know that in the name of Jesus, everything about the cross was part of it, everything about God was part of it, when you carry that name, it is a cure to all of human affliction. I was praying for my sisters. One of them, 32. One of them, 34, two, 32, not married. And these were beauty queens. You know, when they were 24, 25, 26, those days was when Brazilian weed was ready. So they would buy weed, 45,000. They are shoes there, my sister used to call it choker. The shoe had long heels, so when they wear it, they start like this. And then they are walking with audacity. When you want to talk to them, if you, don't, if you are a young man and you don't know who you are, you won't approach them. You will be afraid of embarrassment. <laughs> because of elegance. Elegance. When they became 34 and 35, then they now discover that man is not a function of beauty, it's a function of favor. <laughs> <laughs> because all their friends who were ugly, who have no class, when they meet now, they are talking about husband and children. Ah, I need to go and feed my child. So when they come back from just with their friends, they come back crying. But those days, when they come back, they are the star. All their friends talk about them. They hate them, they hate them, then they dash their money. Now those friends that look and see they were disadvantaged in life through favor, they have a home. And now they discover that their place was not in their father's house. They needed help. That was when they now invoke their brother. They go and I was going to church and they say, focus on your son is home. <laughs> they didn't know that I was paying the price to become the custodian of the name. That by the cross there was a name that gave me authority, not just in this world but in the world to come. Is that power that governed the ages to come? I was pursuing under that name because I knew that one day all of them will depend on me, including my father. <laughs> because I am the hope of my father. So I knew if I fail, I have failed the generation. So when I was laboring in prayers and fasting. Sometimes, those days I fasted until, if you see me, it's only my head. My neck was so long, I was like this. They didn't know that I was fighting to enter into a spiritual economy. And when I apprehended the name, that time they were 34 and 32. So they came to me. They said they needed help. And the moment they recognized the grace, I said, I send you forth. <laughs> At this time, I have known that I am the priest over the family. It is the things I allow that can happen. But I was not told as a story. Sometimes in the place of prayer, the wall of my house will vanish. And then I will see myself standing in my father's compound. And God will show me the principality that those compound. And then he will tell me, the power of this one is pride. The power of this one is immorality. The power of this one is darkness. We never do these things. So I was learning from a syllabus that is superior to everything I studied in school. Meanwhile, I'm not encouraging anybody to leave his education because currently I'm doing my PhD. <laughs> I'm not talking down on education, but I'm telling you that in order to be relevant, you need to study from all the realms of God. There are three realms in this world, the supernatural realm, 
where the power and the government of God dwells, the supernatural realm, which is your foolish realm, where the angelic and the demonic operate, and then the natural realm, where your body and your five senses dwell. You need to learn from the three realms. If you only study from the soulish realm, you will be limited. Because a professor in the soulish realm will be a, 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 a kindergarten in the face of a 10 year old who works in the witchcraft of the reason is not because the gear in the witchcraft of will know so much. The realm where she is studying from is superior to the natural realm. So as a professor, you may have hit the zenith in the soulish realm. But the girl that joined witchcraft for one week, she's studying from the higher realm. So that girl can touch the prof like this. And the prof will become paralyzed. Because what she has is a knowledge in the higher realm. So if you want to be relevant, you need to study from the three realms of God. I was studying from the realm of the spirit. Because I knew that one of the greatest benefits of redemption was the name of Jesus. And that name does not work when it's pronounced alone. It works as a government. I needed to know the things to do, the appetite to kill, the burdens to bear, in order for that name to answer through my voice. And when I gained some level of mastery, I began to control the possibilities of my family. One day my dad woke up and then the left part of his body was no longer working. And then they say it's partial paralysis. I said, okay, they should bring it to my body. When they came to my body, they sat down and And then I walked around. I was speaking to them. They don't know the meaning of tongues. <laughs> they think it's a language, but I know it's a mystery. I didn't know. God did not open my eyes to see what was the cause. And I knew it would be a waste of time to begin to research into the spirit to find out who shot this arrow, who shot this arrow. I knew what was happening around me was a mystery. So me too, I began to play on the economy of mysteries. So I spoke in tongues. 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 After two days, I did. I said they should take it back. When they took it back, it became strong. We study in the realm where it matters the most. But there are many people who don't know the importance and the significance of alignment. So they quote the things that Jesus has done. That's why you don't have experience. No man is special. Everybody is manifesting to the degree to which he submits to the law that makes things happen. You are mighty, you are your You reign, you ancient your
Oh, you are walking by secret now. That's when men become the beach. Jesus said, as the wind, as the wind blow it, thou beach let's not from whence it come to where it go. It says, so are they that are born by the Spirit of God. You woke up that day. You wanted to wear pink shirt because that's the clothes collected from the tailor. Then the Holy Ghost came and said, wear not your white and black shirt. This is not the doctrine, this is life. Meanwhile, the guy that came from the US that's like, looking for wife, God has told him that the lady that come around to us with white and black is a wife. You didn't know. You didn't know why you left the 10,000 for you. You carried the white away to the top of the top. It is a whole bag. No white and black dress. Because that white and black dress that day is not a dress, it's your husband. It's a realm of secret. That's how we rule the world. And then when you graduate from the realm of secret, then God makes you a son. The son is a kingdom. He said the heir, the heir. We have become joint heirs with Christ because we are children of the kingdom. And that's the second gift of the cross. The second gift of the cross is that you have become a part of the family of God. So God has become your father. God is no longer just your Lord. God is no longer just your disciple. God is no longer just your friend. God is now your father. So he has the responsibility of making this work for you. Hope you know for David to go to war, he needed to consult the union and the union. And the Holy Ghost will tell him that when you see the man trees move, he means have come ahead. Go, you will conquer. But Abraham did not need to consult the nation. He had traveled beyond secret. Now he's an heir. So he can just say, oh, and tell someone, come, let him fight. Fight kings and he wins them. Abraham throws a stone like this. He's a son. God is under obligation to provide for him because God is father. I told us yesterday that the meaning of father in Hebrew is true. He is the foundation. God becomes the stability of your life. The meaning of father in the Greek is father. It means sustainer and nourisher. When God becomes your father, he is not his responsibility to provide for you. So even the days you make this day, God will cover you up. Mercy becomes an economy that works for you. Certain things that were not part of the syllabus of training are in full turn of history. That's why every morning we wake up, the Bible said the message of God and give you every morning. Because he knows that sons make you sick. But because they are sons, there is a divine calculation that makes for the advantage, even when they have. It's a privilege that we have because of the cross. And it's on the strength of our sonship that we have authority to make things with you. Because we know we have the backing of Zion. These are provisions that we have in the cross. That's why morning when we wake up, we say, Ah, ah, eh, eh, ah, 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 ah,
If I need something that is not on earth, even when I don't ask God, I know that my God has to bring it. That's why some of you are in angelic visitation. You came somewhere, you didn't have a gift to orchestrate healing. But when you said be healed, the angel that walked with you move and talk to the person is your brother. <laughs> My family is large. My dad is on your back. They don't have anything. There's no money there. All they have is my one. But when I know that I will network the whole world, I'm not talking because of the resources from your back. I know that now I have become the son of Abraham. The Bible said Abraham was rich in gold and in cattle, and God blessed him in all things. He said, If ye are heirs, then you have become the heir of the promise, and you are here for children of Abraham according to the promise. So when we speak, we don't speak because of the resources in our bank account. We know that we are now a part of the family. And when we speak through family network and bloodline, spiritual DNA, we are connected with the source that is bigger than time. That's why when we pray, we pray to heaven. Because we are now part of the families of heaven. Our genealogy through the cross travels into the heaven. Our father, who art in heaven, not who art in Zaria. Even the governor of Zaria, there's Concadina, there's so much you cannot do. But when you pray to heaven, then you mobilize the resources that created the world and gather the foundations of the earth together. It is a mystery that the cross provides us, making us to become part of the family of God. My friend knows I don't pray for anything I need. I'll just wake up in the morning and say, Kai, God said he wants to announce me. Hey, hey, hey. You won't know why it will happen. We we were see, we were very short thing can We will just stay there, we come to lead prayer. But December last year, God said, there's a temptation coming, don't fall. I came and told them, see, see what God is saying. As we were entering into the next year, I said, Baba, God said this is the year of emergence. The emergence of kings. And then he said he did the same thing. I said, we now began to call ourselves kings at home. How this thing will happen, we don't know. Remember, we are Shopnika Bearers in what? A remnant. There are many senior pastors ahead of us on the rank. We were not even ordained at that time. In this year, they put call on my neck. So we were not even ministers. And then a day to my birthday, I said, oh man, God said he wants to begin to announce me. Hey! How is that going to happen? You wonder for some of your side, what are you calling announcement? The man talks like a god. How will you be heard? Your place is to serve so that anything that falls will fall to you. And thank God is a good man. So the things that will fall to you will be enough to sustain your life. But God said, I want to begin to announce you. How will God do this thing? I gave my throne away. The hell Satan wants to announce me. And on my birthday, which is first of March, he said, cut six of your clip and put it on Telegram. It was something. People were troubling him saying, where is this guy's message? When I received the talk, I said, okay, something take. And something released those six clips from Telegram. On the 11th of March, that was 10 days after the clips were released, I received call from 17 nations of the world. <laughs> from Macaulay. How can you be here? On the 14th of March, 13 days after that action, I received four invitations from the United States of America. <laughs> Somebody came, he said, what's the name of your ministry? We want to open a branch, we want to open a head office so that we can have workers working here to coordinate your invitation in the U.S. Do you know how many years it takes to receive invitation outside the borders of your habitation? But the hell is that I came, he said, I will begin to announce it. In Remnant, we have raised the dead. In Remnant, we have seen bones, men dead. This is not Apostle Aaron's testimonies. Those of us who are on ground, we see all kinds of healing, but nobody knew us. But the answer that came, he said, I want to begin to announce you. So, if I give a charge of five minutes, the angels come and they blow the shofar. <laughs> so, people hear, they don't hear my voice, they hear the voice of God. That's why John went into the wilderness until the day of the showing God. And when John came out, he didn't the Bible. All he knew to do was to cry. And when John cried, the Bible said the whole of Gideon when it is the blood of an iron. You don't know what to carry. Oh, until God speaks, things will change. For the past three months, you can't rest. We have meetings from Tuesday to Sunday. Tuesday to Sunday. Between the last two weeks, you know, we have spoken in five universities with nothing less than two. 500 attendants. People come, they say, we've heard your messages. Oh, thank you for being a blessing to the body of Christ. I say, mm-hmm. which one the body of Christ? Oh, what are you talking about? In less than six months, 
We are nations. They said they want to bring me to bring you here. How is it happening? Because you have become a part of that family. Your alignment quota is complete, then it gives you your inheritance. And then in Galatians, you will be here. You will be in Zanda here. You think it's all about Selma. You don't know what God is doing. These men are called by ordination to be catalyst of revival. The people who will carry the revival, they are not even emerged. Because the revival is a spirit of righteousness and signs and wonders. Some of you that come for Polonia, you are not known. The day of your rising, you will say, you will come and kneel down before someone and say, Thank God, you are the one that made me there. You say, You will be aware. You will be shocked that somebody like this who has no name was part of Polonia. You will rise, you will enter the territories, and the dead will rise on their own. And the world will say, A man of wonder has risen because your own quota of alignment has been fulfilled. People who went to the same place with Catherine Kuma, they said they didn't remember her. Because she was so quiet and free, you can't imagine that any spiritual possibility can break out of this one. But when the alignment quota was completed, she rose up as the brightest revelation of the hidden dimension of God. They may say, my woman, hey, no, hey, women don't have a voice in the north. They are joking. They are joking. They are joking. People from Akoswaro men now from the United Kingdom. They say, who is this boy? Who is this boy? my son. You are a member of the family of God. The first time I heard my message, I said, Kai, I need to go back and work on my intonation because I was talking like a little mama. I didn't hear my message. They said my messages are going. I said I will not hear. Because when I heard it, I was so disappointed at the quality of English. How can I be talking like this? I said, no, I want to add some phonetics, some coordination. But every time I tried to compose myself, the life that flowed to the message was choked. So I knew that for me, it was a voice of a man crying in the wilderness. Crying because God came as a father. He said, this is your inheritance. A day will come when some of your hand will not become the hand of God. The hand of God. So when you come for meeting, you can be playing and laughing. But when you lift your hand like the scriptures will begin to rise. Then they will say there is a man that carries the hand of God. We do not read about Moses. He ran out of Israel. He was in the wilderness for 40 years. What was he doing? Attending to sheep. But when God visited him, the rod that he had all these years that was meant for eating sheep, he didn't know that that was the rod of God. And the point came, that same rod, he will point it to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea will part. That same rod, and army will come to fight Israel. So long as he holds that rod like this, that rod became the banner of God over Israel. What you carry is enough. The problem is that the quota of alignment has not been achieved. When God begins to announce you, you will say, Is this in me? You will be shocked because it will be bigger than your imagination. He said, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can think or imagine. It's the workings of God. You reign. You reign, Shenzai.
You are supposed to be a spectacle to creation because you are the only one that the fullness of God was given to. The Bible said, Please, the Father, that the fullness of God will be in Jesus' body. And what we see through the cross was Jesus. So, man is the only recipient of the fullness of God. Man is supposed to be the greatest spectacle of creation. Paul said, You are the glory of God. That was the first time the glory of God was likened to the creation. And man is the only one that has that statue. The reason why it looks like a chalet and beggar is because those things that the Holy Ghost keep imposing on your heart, you keep rejecting it. But the name of the Lord will become powerful in the hand of somebody today who says, Suffer it to be so for now. Everything that God says I should be and be because I will put an end to rebellion. Most of us are in churches. We cannot as much as come out to carry out responsibilities. When they say there's prayer meeting, the church goes half. If they say there's evangelism, the church goes out. 90% doesn't show up because we don't understand the importance of the things of the kingdom. That's where our true definition lies. Some of the men you go to celebrate, you are greater than them. But you don't know about your ordination. The day of the nation will begin to speak. Hope you know that Paul was in the regions of Galilee and Nazareth. When their Peter were cast, raising cripples by shadows. He said he knew Jesus after the flesh. But he said now he knows him no more. So he saw what they were doing. When Paul's encounter came, he became greater than all the apostles. But will you be willing like Paul to say, Lord, what will you have me do? There was a chance that that raised yesterday. I want us to pray now. I want us to pray now. We'll pray for the next 10 minutes. And then... I will pray for some people and then we'll be out of your presence. Who can help us with that chat now? Taking her to the hotel, she kept telling me, 
I want to see Apostle Mike in Morocco. I want to see Apostle Mike. I said, Ma, I have been your protocol for the past two weeks. She almost collapsed. God will soon give you a name that will change everything that crippled your life. Somebody flew in from Edinburgh, Scotland. It was my message in him to walk the plane. People coming from the UK, they were not just coming from IC, they said they want to see Apostle Mike Morocco. How was it noise at all? I never knew that some of us would even be here outside the waters of Penguin. The limitations you see there in mind. The devil is deceiving you. This morning, you want to cry to Jesus and say, if you do business with men, I am available. And if you walk with nothing, here am I. If you walk with nothing because I have nothing to offer, here am I. Here am I. And God, God. Ay, 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 ay. Make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend and also make sure that you like the video so that youtube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message if you have any question please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you and also if you are watching this video and you don't know jesus christ ask the lord and personal savior i want you to make that decision just contact us in the description Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.